In Ukraine's battle for air supremacy with Russia, a swarm of tiny Black Hornet drones might just give it the edge. These drones act as eyes for Ukrainian troops on the ground, and thanks to the US, UK and Norway, Ukraine now has an entire fleet of them ready to be deployed at a moment's notice. In July 2023, the United States announced that it would deliver $400 million in security assistance to Ukraine. Beyond the typical armored vehicles and air defense missiles, that package would also include Black Hornet drones made by Teledyne FLIR Defense. A month later, the UK made a similar announcement. Working with Norwegian manufacturers, it would spend $9 million on these micro drones, sending them over to Ukraine for use as covert surveillance tools. All told, Ukraine now has over 1,000 of these drones at its disposal and they're helping Kyiv slowly turn the tide against Putin's invading forces. But how? How could a tiny drone, designed to look like a helicopter, have such a huge impact? To answer that question, we must start by asking the following. What are Black Hornet drones? The simple answer is they are miniature unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, that are designed specifically for reconnaissance. Unlike many of the other drones that Ukraine uses, some of which come equipped with attack capabilities, the Black Hornet drone is all about stealth. But that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to its superpowers. The first generation of these drones was created in 2011 by Teledyne Fleur and quickly found themselves in heavy use in Afghanistan. They're designed to be small enough for ground-based troops to carry. They even come with their own carry case, and they can be deployed at a moment's notice. In Ukraine's case, they've received shipments of the Black Hornet 3, which measures just 6.6 .6 inches from nose to tail and weighs only 1.16 ounces. In other words, they're tiny. So tiny, in fact, that the drones are easy to hide among foliage and trees, making them almost imperceptible to opposing troops unless the drones are flown straight into them. Furthermore, the drones are designed to be practically silent when in operation. The telltale buzzing that usually accompanies these types of UAVs isn't present, making it even harder to detect the Black Hornet. Also unlike other drones, the Black Hornet does away with the quadcopter design that's typically used for UAVs. Instead, it looks like just a tiny helicopter, only one that's equipped with several high-definition cameras that are capable of sending footage to the operative controlling the drone. That design choice also means that Black Hornets can squeeze through much smaller gaps than quadcopter UAVs, ideal for sneaking into buildings and navigating difficult terrain. The Black Hornets have an impressive 25-minute flight time, giving the user plenty of time to get in and out with the drone, and takes about the same amount of time to recharge. As a result, the drone can be deployed several times per day, with each flight revealing more about the area over which it flies. But all of that tech doesn't come cheap. The most recent publicly available pricing for the drone puts it at $195,000 per unit. Given that Ukraine has received about 1,300 of the drones since the beginning of Putin's war, that would mean that Kyiv's Black Hornet fleet has cost $2.73 billion to date. That's a lot of money to spend on a fleet of tiny helicopters, but it's money well spent once you recognize the extent of the Black Hornet's abilities. First, there's the simple ease of deployment to consider. Unlike traditional drones, which often need to be launched from the ground and will weigh down any troops carrying them, the Black Hornet is so tiny that it can be launched from a soldier's hand. Seeing one take off is almost like watching somebody launch a toy helicopter. Just place it on a surface and hit a button. The drone zooms into the air to be directed by the soldier's remote control from the ground. That simplicity makes it a weapon of immense power. Granted, the Black Hornet has no attack capabilities, meaning it isn't a weapon in the traditional sense, but the fact that it can be launched by anyone from almost anywhere gives it a level of versatility that most drones simply don't offer. A platoon of soldiers could send several of them into the skies in an instant, giving them a clear bird's eye view of the terrain below. And when the Black Hornet is done, it can be landed right back on the soldier's hand and tucked into a pocket. However, the miniature nature of the drones does come with some downsides. When the British first started using the Black Hornet in Afghanistan in 2013, they found that something very simple could cause issues – a gust of wind. According to one soldier, a good gust of wind will send the Black Hornet off, meaning that Ukraine's soldiers face some limitations when using them. Still, those limitations aren't quite as severe as what the Brits faced. Back then, the Black Hornet weighed just 16 grams, making it easy to knock off course. The third generation of the device, the one being sent to Ukraine, is a little heavier and is now capable of standing winds of up to 17.3 miles per hour. That's more strength than the Black Hornet used to have. However, according to the Beaufort wind scale, a 17.3 mile per hour wind qualifies as a moderate breeze. 
If the wind is strong enough to raise dust from the ground or rustle loose paper, it's probably strong enough to knock a black hornet off course. Rain can also be an issue. According to Teledyne Fleur's specifications document, the Black Hornet can handle precipitation of 0.1 inches, which qualifies as a light rain. Anything above that means the rain is so heavy that the tiny drone can't fly properly, meaning it's best deployed when conditions are clear. Still, it has a solid temperature range of between 14 and 109.4 degrees Fahrenheit, making it usable in freezing cold conditions and extremely hot locations. Having a weapon that can be overcome with a decent gust of wind or a little bit of rain might not seem like the best idea in the world. But the Black Hornet makes up for that design issue, which is inherent in something as small as the drone, with amazing stealth capabilities. The drone comes equipped with a set of tiny electronic motors that are battery-powered and combined with the aerodynamic design to make it extremely quiet when it's in the air. The drone is practically silent, with almost none of the telltale buzzing seen in other UAVs. That's ideal for its use to surveil hostile environments. Even a slight amount of background noise serves as enough cover to make the Black Hornet drone almost impossible to hear. According to Engineering.com, a soldier will have no idea it's even there as long as the drone stays more than 10 feet away from them. That near silence is complemented by a smart design to emphasize control. Assuming the drone flies in relatively windless conditions, its slight wing shape, coupled with a design inspired by birds and insects, means it can be controlled almost perfectly. The drone can turn on a dime, with little to no build-up needed to get it to navigate corners. Again, that makes it useful in stealth operations, as a soldier can quickly fly the Black Hornet around a corner or behind a tree to prevent anybody from being aware of its presence. The vortex generators installed on the Black Hornet's wings play a large part in improving the drone's handling. These generators create small vortices of air, localized to small portions of the wings, that allow for easier control when the drone is moving at slow speeds. The generators also reduce stall speeds, allowing the user to quickly slow down and, when conducting surveillance, to have the drone hover in place so it can get clear shots of its surroundings. Better yet, the drone can fly up to heights of 1.5 kilometers, approximately 0.93 miles, again allowing for quick escapes. Then there are the Black Hornet's image capturing capabilities to consider. The drone often comes in sets of two, with one being equipped with cameras to capture daytime footage while the other specializes in shooting footage at night. The unit comes with a pair of electro-optical or EO cameras, one at the front and one that shoots footage below the drone that can capture video at a 640x480 resolution. If a soldier wants to take photos of the environment, those EO cameras can send back pictures with a resolution of 1600x1200, strong enough to record even the smallest of details on the battlefield. The thermal imaging cameras built into the nighttime versions of the drone aren't as powerful. They deliver video and images at a resolution of 160 by 120. That's enough to get a general idea of how many troops may be in a location, for instance, though not detailed enough to deliver any specifics. All imagery and video can be recorded or streamed live to a tablet operated by the user, with the Black Hornet having a radio range of 1.24 miles. That's more than enough for covert operatives to maintain their distance from a target while surveilling it. Best of all, every scrap of the drone's recorded footage is encrypted and stored on a 64GB SD card that can be easily removed or replaced as needed. The same goes for the cameras. All can be replaced with spares if they happen to go offline for any reason. The manufacturers have gone to great lengths to ensure that the cameras are easy to use. With the tablet that comes with the Hornet, a soldier can simply tap a screen to take a snapshot, all while watching streamed video. It's almost like playing a video game. Using the tablet and a remote control, the user moves the drone around, hitting a button to take snapshots whenever they're needed. But what if a soldier doesn't want to put themselves at risk while controlling the drone? Thanks to the Black Hornet's advanced artificial intelligence, or AI systems, they don't have to. Each Black Hornet comes equipped with an autonomous navigation mode that allows the user to pre-program a flight route into it. That programming means it can fly to its target without being directly controlled, with the drone even having the ability to return to its dock automatically when it senses that it's running out of juice. The AI built into the drone is also able to adapt to changing environmental conditions. That's ideal if wind or rain pushes it off course. Using its AI, the Black Hornet can course correct so it gets back onto its intended flight path. This autonomy is achieved through a small array of onboard sensors built into the drone, which help it to detect obstacles nearby so that it doesn't accidentally collide with them. Advanced GPS built into the drone also makes it easy to set a route. 
Simply choose a location and the drone can use its GPS systems to figure out the best way to get there. All of that data that the Black Hornet picks up via its sensors is fed through complex AI algorithms, enabling it to fly safely without anybody being in direct control. There's even an optional visual-based navigation unit that the drone can use to fly indoors when it has no access to GPS. So it's an impressive piece of technology. But how has Ukraine been using the Black Hornet? The clear and most obvious use is for reconnaissance and surveillance. As Ukrainian troops advance on Russian positions, they can deploy the drones ahead of themselves to get the lay of the land before they launch operations. And thanks to the drone's high-resolution cameras, they can track Russian troop movements easily, figuring out the best times and places to strike. Think about this potential scenario. A Ukrainian platoon advances to the edge of a Russian position. Hiding out of sight, a soldier launches a Black Hornet and sends it flying high above the Russians, where the drone spends about 20 minutes recording footage and sending snapshots. Immediately, the Ukrainians can see how many soldiers are stationed at the Russian position, as well as get detailed imagery of artillery and other weapons. They'll also see weak points. Any gaps in the Russian defense can be picked up by the Black Hornet, with the drone being small enough to fly in and out of buildings, as well as around rubble, to locate an ideal attack position. And as one drone runs out of power and has to return to the soldier who launched it, another drone can be sent into the skies to replace it. That's where the drone's small size becomes a massive advantage. According to The Economist, a single Ukrainian platoon has 20 soldiers. Each of these soldiers could easily carry a Black Hornet, delivering about 400 minutes of surveillance footage per platoon. A small fleet of Hornets could easily surveil an entire Russian station in minutes, with the footage being stitched together to reveal everything about what the platoon will face when it launches its attack. The Russians would have no idea that the Hornets are even above them. It's this ability to surveil that also helps Ukraine to knock Russian jets out of the sky. The Black Hornet is so tiny that it simply doesn't show up on a jet's radar. And even if a pilot spots it, the jet won't be able to do a thing to destroy the drone. The Black Hornet is far more maneuverable. Before the pilot could even adjust their jet to fire on it, the drone would be gone, likely heading back to its user. And just like that, the Ukrainians would know exactly where the jet is and the flight path it's taking. The Russian pilot would have two choices either abort their mission and turn back, risking the wrath of Moscow by failing to complete their objective, or carry on flying, likely into Ukrainian anti-air defenses, and risk losing their plane and their own life. It's a lose-lose situation. Assuming the pilot even sees the Black Hornet tracking them, the likelihood is that they won't, meaning the Ukrainians can launch their anti-air attacks before the pilot even realizes what's happening. These scenarios aren't outside the realms of possibility. According to the European Council on Foreign Relations, or ECFR, Ukraine used the larger TB2 drone to help it target the initial Russian convoy that tried to ride into Kyiv. It's also believed that a TB2 was used to distract the defensives of the Moskva ship, giving Ukrainian soldiers enough time to fire the naval missiles that ultimately sank the Russian vessel. With the Black Hornet, Ukraine has an even smaller drone at its disposal, one that will help targeting without ever being spotted by the enemy. Consider also the propaganda uses of the Black Hornet. Recording footage of Russian troop movements may be useful for Ukrainian attacks, but it also shines a light on what those troops are doing as they advance. Every atrocity committed, every civilian killed. If a Black Hornet is present, it can all be filmed and distributed, helping Ukraine to make an even better case for why the rest of the world needs to help them overcome the Russian threat. And thanks to the Black Hornet's high-resolution snapshots and high-quality video feeds, there will be no doubting any of the footage the drone shot. Again, this is a proven Ukrainian tactic. Kyiv has used drones to document the destruction of several Ukrainian cities during the war, as well as the breaching of the Kokovka Dam. It also uses drones to record its own attacks against Russian ships, tanks and jets, all valuable morale-boosting propaganda to spread among its forces. There's also the simple fact that using drones protects troops. In the case of the Black Hornet, that's been a proven benefit of these UAVs since they were first deployed in Afghanistan. Newsweek made that clear when it shared the comments of Major Adam Foden, a British soldier who used them during his time fighting against Afghan insurgents. Previously, we would have sent soldiers forward to see if there were any enemy fighters hiding inside a set of buildings, he said. Now we are deploying Black Hornets to look inside compounds and to clear a route through enemy-held spaces. Ukraine is doing the same. Every Black Hornet deployed accounts for one soldier who doesn't have to risk their life to surveil a Russian position. 
Ukraine gets to protect its troops, who can stay over a mile away from a Russian position, while still receiving a clear video feed that shows them exactly what they need to know. This risk reduction means that a Ukrainian platoon doesn't have to take any chances and lose valuable members just to figure out how to launch an attack. It can use Black Hornets and attack at full strength every single time. However, using the Black Hornet doesn't come without risk. That was made clear in a July 2023 article published in Bulgarian Military, which said that soldiers from Russia's Wolves Brigade, a reconnaissance unit, had captured two of the drones. Both were seized during a shootout in Novaya Tavolzhanka that resulted in the Russians managing to retain the trophy control complex. That was a significant event. The Black Hornet is made using proprietary technology to which the Russians don't currently have access. Teledyne Fleur isn't selling to them, which means they can't fill the skies with swarms like the Ukrainians can. Yet. Now that they have a pair of these drones, Russia can try to reverse engineer them to figure out the science and tech behind how they work. Whether they'll be successful or not is another matter. The Black Hornet uses encryption to protect the videos that it shoots, so you have to assume that it has even more powerful encryption guarding the AI algorithms and subroutines built into its system. But even if it takes Russia years to come up with its own version of the Black Hornet, the fact that it has the tech in its hands makes the process a little more straightforward. And even if Moscow decides not to go down the reverse engineering route, it can at least use this pair of Hornets. It can figure out their capabilities and, possibly, figure out a way to counter them. Or with more captures, it may be able to build up a small fleet that it can use to plan attacks of its own in the future. The Ukrainians could start to see their own tech being used against them if they're not careful. Still, the use of Black Hornet drones has been a massive boom for Ukraine in its fight against Russia. The tiny drones have enabled Ukrainian soldiers to get the jump on Moscow's finest in more than a few conflicts, and have been valuable for capturing footage used for reconnaissance and even propaganda purposes. The only question we have left is simple. What does the future hold? Right now, the Black Hornet is relatively harmless in terms of its attack prowess. In short, it has none. There are no weapons built into the drone, meaning it exists solely to capture footage and shoot photos but the potential exists to make it a much more dangerous device. Imagine a world where Teledyne Fleur decides to build a version of the Black Hornet that doesn't have a full array of cameras. Instead, they load it up with an explosive device, one that can be triggered from over a mile away, or thanks to the AI algorithms in the drone, programmed to explode once the Black Hornet reaches its location. The drone would become a silent killer. By the time the target realized that the drone was even there, it would be practically on top of them. It's only visible from 50 feet against a perfectly clear backdrop. You can only hear the minor buzzing the drone produces if the Black Hornet is 10 feet away. Could we see the war delve into scenarios where soldiers are constantly on the lookout for these miniature drones, taking pot shots at any they see to prevent them from causing serious damage? Perhaps militaries will start to counter these drones with new tech that surrounds their installations with simulated winds and rainwater, preventing the Black Hornets from penetrating. Only the future will tell. For now, the Black Hornet is one of the most powerful weapons Ukraine has at its disposal, even if it's not technically a weapon. It gives troops clear sets of eyes in the sky, eyes that can work day and night, that provide valuable information for missions. Added to the many other drones that Ukraine is using, as well as the many that its civilians use to capture footage for their own military, and Putin's war may go down in history as the first to truly feature drone warfare. So what do you think about the Black Hornet? Is this impressive little device everything that it's cracked up to be, or do you see flaws that could be overcome in the future? Maybe you have some other ideas about how it may be used to Ukraine's advantage. Tell us what you think in the comments, and thanks for watching the video. Ukrainian sharpshooters have proven very effective in their fight against Russian invaders. It helps that they have the biggest sniper rifle in the world in their hands, one which has some of the longest kills on record and which can penetrate most types of armor at long ranges for cheap prices. What is this rifle? How have Ukrainian forces used it? And what does it say about the future of the sniper? Let's take a look. Warfare has changed dramatically through the past three centuries. What was once an activity that relied on mass fire to compensate for the inaccuracy of early small arms and artillery has gradually become more precision-based as weapons become more accurate over longer distances. The rise of the sniper in the late 18th century, thanks to the advent of cheaper rifled barrels, is one of the best early examples of precision targeting in warfare. 
Demand for snipers has been high in conflicts ever since the American Revolutionary War, where they helped to turn the tide of critical battles like Saratoga in 1777. Snipers first proved their effectiveness on the battlefield against individual enemies, especially officers, which were easy to target because of the ornate uniforms that they wore. The increased range and accuracy of small arms forced officers to wear plainer clothing by the end of the 19th century. After proving themselves in the anti-personnel role, snipers began to use even larger firearms loaded with special-purpose heavy machine gun rounds to target enemy vehicles like supply trucks or even tanks. Although tank armor became too strong for these weapons to damage in World War II, anti-material rifles are still effective against a wide variety of other targets. Thanks to the advent of these rifles, the sniper became a threat not only to men on foot but even to those who were riding inside vehicles like armored personnel carriers. The sniper's effectiveness as a force multiplier continued to increase, although sharpshooters still often lacked weapons that could serve all of their needs. Early snipers tended to be hunters who were singled out for their roles thanks to their experience. This is why most sniper rifles, even into the 1970s, were adapted from hunting rifles. But such a dynamic limited the development in the kind of ammunition they could use. Things started to change in the 1980s. One of these changes was the further evolution of the sniper's increasing anti-material purpose. This was the time when the famous American 50 caliber Barrett sniper rifle was invented by a Tennessee man named Ronnie Barrett. The use of the Browning machine gun round for this weapon gave the sniper much longer reach and power, increasing the diversity of targets that could be destroyed. Dedicated sharpshooters used to targeting enemy infantry would also have a go-to weapon that could be used to target vehicles. Recruitment and training methods for snipers also started changing at this time. Typical sniper training in modern armies can take a year or more, and Ukraine was once no exception to this. However, because they are so badly needed at the front, Ukraine's sniper schools have given candidates a crash course that can be completed in a few weeks. The war in Ukraine has proven that in this age of precision artillery and drone surveillance, snipers need weapons that are accurate over increasingly long ranges to be effective and to ensure their survival. Fortunately for Ukraine, one of the weapons it has in its arsenal is the Snipex Alligator, and it's the longest sniper rifle in the world, with a length of 6 feet 6 inches when it's fully assembled. Experts have described this weapon as one which makes even previous anti-material rifles like the M107 Barrett seem like pea shooters in comparison. What are the specs of this weapon? Let's take a deep dive. The Snipex Alligator is a domestically produced rifle that made its debut in June 2020. The rifle is manufactured by a company called Zado, which was founded in 1991 in Kharkiv, Ukraine. The company has since expanded internationally with headquarters in Germany and the Netherlands. It's a nanotechnology-based chemical company that specializes in ceramics, lubricants, oil and fuel additives, not to mention firearms. Zado is an experienced manufacturer that has over 1,600 items in its company product line. Two of them are the anti-material Alligator and T-Rex rifles. The Alligator has a barrel length of 47 inches, which is more than twice the length of a typical hunting rifle designed to engage targets at long distances. Even the Barrett M107's barrel is small by comparison, at 27 inches. The rifle has a mass of 25 kilograms, weighs 55 pounds, and is chambered for the 14.5 by 114 mm anti-material round. This round, which has a mass between 59 and 66 grams and a weight of about 2.2 ounces, originated in the Soviet Union during World War II. There, it was used as the ammunition for the KPV heavy machine gun and in anti-tank rifles like the PTRS-41 and the PTRD-41, weapons which have seen some use in the Ukrainian conflict today. Since World War II, this round has been used internationally in other anti-material rifles, anti-aircraft guns, and in the machine guns mounted on armored personnel carriers. The 14.5 by 114mm round comes in several different varieties, such as tracers, armor-piercing incendiary, and high-explosive incendiary. The alligator's effective range is 2 km, but it has a maximum range of 7 km. To make it more accurate, Zado designed it as a bolt-action rifle. This reduces the tilt of the battle, which would be significant for a round of this size if it was firing in semi-automatic mode. The alligator's receiver is made of steel and its bolt guides are chrome-plated, which reduces the amount of dirt and grime built up in the barrel as a result of repeat firing. The rifle comes with a detachable box magazine that can hold five rounds inside. The muzzle velocity is almost 1,000 meters per second, nearly Mach 3. A trained shooter can fire 12 rounds per minute. The alligator can be used to attack dynamic as well as static targets. 
The alligator has a design that compensates for the large recoil of its round in several ways. First, its sheer weight absorbs much of the energy and keeps the weapon steady, preventing the operator from feeling its full effect. Second, it comes with a recoil isolating buttstock and a 4 or 5 baffle muzzle brake. Third, the shoulder stock is padded to reduce the wear and tear on the operator, although experts believe that this measure is likely ineffective in reducing recoil itself. The rifle has a height-adjustable cheek rest that can be installed on either the right or left side. It also comes with a carrying handle that can be changed depending on if the operator carries it with a mounted silencer. To facilitate the transport of this weapon at longer ranges, the alligator's barrel can be detached quickly from the main body. The rifle and barrel can be then stored alongside one another in a compact transport case. To increase its accuracy, the alligator can come equipped with different sighting devices and features a floating barrel that whips naturally under recoil. A folding four-position adjustable bipod and rear-adjustable monopod come with the rifle too, in order to further stabilize it when it shoots. The alligator also has a little brother, the Snipex T-Rex rifle, which is essentially the same device, but this one is in a bullpup configuration without the detachable magazine, meaning it can hold only one round at a time. Both the Alligator and T-Rex rifles are coated with a special paint called Cerakote. Although it might sound trivial, this is an important attribute in their durability. Cerakote is a ceramic paint coating that provides enhanced protection against the elements. Firearms coated with Cerakote show fewer signs of wear and tear by becoming more resistant against corrosion and abrasion. Cerakote also provides better protection for the weapon when it's exposed to potentially degrading chemicals, meaning that it can be fielded for longer and under tougher conditions before requiring repair and replacement. Prior to the advent of Cerakote, the preferred way to keep firearms protected from corrosive materials and the elements was through stainless and blued steel finishes. While this helped in many ways, the material did not hold up well in watery conditions, which are common in a frontline deployment. To protect these weapons against water, water-repellent oil was traditionally required. Cerakote solves the same problems that stainless and blued steel finishes did, while also being protective against water. Cerakote coating can be finished in different colors, enhancing the concealability of the rifle, a crucial factor for the success of any sniper. Cerakote coating cannot be done on its own, however. It requires a trained gunsmith to apply it. Ukraine's gunsmiths are therefore likely coating the alligator with Cerakote as the mission requires for the troops using it. In January 2021, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense announced that it would adopt the alligator into service based on satisfactory test results. It claimed that the alligator showed the ability to accomplish missions that current sniper rifles would not be able to do, all while managing recoil to an acceptable level. The rifles began to be introduced into use in March of that year. The arrival came just in time to be deployed in significant numbers to counter the Russian invasion that came a year later. Reports have circulated that British special operations soldiers have been training Ukrainian snipers in how to use the new sniper rifle. It remains to be seen if this means that the British Ministry of Defense is considering adoption of the weapon for the United Kingdom's armed forces. So far, no foreign nation has introduced the Alligator or the T-Rex into official service. It's not known how many of these rifles have been deployed in Ukraine, but it's likely that Ukrainian special operations forces have made use of it in significant numbers in missions against high-priority targets. There are also likely sharpshooters armed with it in the regular infantry divisions on the front lines. Perhaps as a testament to its ability to absorb recoil, some of the women serving as snipers in the Ukrainian armed forces have been seen using the alligator. One of the more famous images of this weapon is with an unidentified woman holding two of the rifles upright, revealing how much taller they are than her. The barrel, especially with a silencer attached to it, is so long that it even looks to be at least a head taller than most of the men who have taken pictures with it in the upright position. The alligator has made its mark on the battlefields of Ukraine in a few notable instances. The weapon reportedly saw its first significant use in the Battle of Mariupol between February and May 2022. There, the controversial Azov Brigade, which has been linked to neo-Nazi ideology and which Putin has used as an item in his propaganda justifying the war, was reportedly using the alligator to deadly effect against Russian forces before the battle ended in the city's steel plant. In November 2023, a Ukrainian soldier named Vyacheslav Kowalski set a new record for the longest confirmed sniper kill while using the alligator. He took out a Russian soldier at a distance of 3.8 kilometers, 2.5 miles. This kill easily broke the previous record, which came at the hands of a Canadian Special Forces sniper in Iraq in 2017 with a range of 3.5 kilometers. That was not the only notable feat of an alligator in the hands of a Ukrainian sniper. 
Unfortunately, not much else is known about this incident. A year earlier, another Ukrainian sniper whose name is not known used his alligator to kill two targets at a range of 2.7 kilometers, 1.8 miles. It was reported as the second most distant confirmed sniper kill at the time, behind the Canadian sniper shot. This incident is better known because there's a video of it. The Ukrainian military's strategic communications office uploaded this video to Telegram on November 13th, 2022. In the video, a Russian soldier is seen walking through a tree line, with a sniper following him through the site with night vision equipped. According to popular mechanics, the site was likely at 20 times magnification. Once the Russian soldier stopped walking, the sniper fired once. About three seconds later, the target fell. Another Russian soldier, who ran in to aid his fallen comrade, was then targeted and shot. The time for the bullet to arrive to the targets, when measured against the weapon's known muzzle velocity, likely makes the video and the shot an authentic display of the Ukrainian sniper's prowess, and not an item of propaganda, as other sources were claiming. Despite these spectacular anti-personnel feats, the Alligator sniper rifle was designed primarily to serve in an anti-material role, rather than targeting individual enemy infantry. The long range at which this rifle is designed to engage its targets ensures that specific enemy personnel will be comparatively difficult for operators to reach, although the rifle can disrupt movement and formations of infantry by providing harassing fire from several kilometers away. The alligator can also be used to destroy some obstacles impeding the movement of friendly infantry, such as wooden constructions or concrete walls. The alligator is best suited to destroying light vehicles, fortified positions like dugouts, communications equipment, radar stations, ammunition and fuel deposits, air defense systems, and aircraft on a runway or in a hangar. These targets are much larger and easier to shoot from a long distance. There are even reports that the rifle is accurate enough at long ranges to target helicopters in flight, although there are no confirmed instances of such an engagement. The material targets the alligator is designed to destroy are expensive. Anti-material rifles like the Alligator and its smaller cousin the T-Rex therefore assist Ukraine in waging asymmetric warfare against its larger and more deep-pocketed attacker. The rifle's round can hit its target with 23,380 pounds, about 12 tons, of force, over twice as much as that which would come from a 50 caliber Browning machine gun round. This is far more than enough force to destroy a cinderblock wall. Any enemy soldier getting hit by such a round would be turned into mincemeat. According to Snipex, the rifle can penetrate 10mm steel armor at a range of 1.5 kilometers. That's enough force to punch through the side armor of Russian armored personnel carriers like the BTR-80, putting all of the troops inside in danger. According to the Oryx blog, Russia has lost 1,196 armored fighting vehicles as of February 19, 2024. 802 of them have been destroyed. It's also lost 3,435 infantry fighting vehicles and 397 armored personnel carriers. These estimates are likely understatements because Oryx only counts visually confirmed losses. It's not known how many of these losses came at the hands of Ukrainian snipers using the Alligator, but Ukraine's defenders, having access to a powerful and cheap anti-material weapon, is certainly responsible for part of the destruction that Russia has faced. More lightly armored targets, like supply trucks, are easy prey to the alligator's round. Ukrainian snipers armed with it have undoubtedly used it to disrupt the columns supplying Russian forces, increasing the logistical difficulties that the Kremlin's armies have suffered during the war. A video released on September 29, 2022, demonstrates the alligator's anti-material function. The video showed a Ukrainian sniper using it to engage an armored target from a distance of over 2 kilometers. The target in the grainy video was identified as a Russian tank. The sniper landed at least one shot on the vehicle, with the video cutting shortly afterward. Although the vehicle was not destroyed or showed any signs of significant damage, it demonstrated the range at which a trained alligator operator could fire with effect and the grave danger that it poses to more lightly armored Russian vehicles. The danger increases the closer the sniper gets. At 100 meters, the alligator's round can penetrate 30 millimeters of steel armor putting heavier units at risk, although this would also put the sniper in far greater danger. Escaping after a shot while carrying such a long and heavy load will not be easy. For this reason, most sniping missions with the alligator will come at longer ranges. Part of the reason for the importance of the alligator's anti-material function is that it's a much cheaper option to destroy these targets than other portable anti-armor weapons. For example, a Javelin missile can cost $80,000 a piece. The launcher itself runs into six figures. 
These pieces of equipment also require a sophisticated supply chain in order to manufacture and transport, which means their numbers will necessarily be limited. In contrast, the alligator will cost four or five figures. The rifle's precise price tag is not listed. There are also millions of 14.5 by 110 mm rounds available to use, and it's easy to manufacture more of them locally. The presence of the alligator allows for Ukrainian forces to avoid using expensive javelin or NLAW rounds on lower priority targets, saving them as they were intended to be used against enemy main battle tanks. This is another way that the alligator's presence assists Ukraine's asymmetric fight against Russia. As good as it is, the alligator comes with dangers to the operator. We've mentioned its length and weight potentially making escape difficult, and that's not the only thing a sniper using it needs to worry about. Although it can carry a silencer to reduce its profile, the muzzle flash created when firing around is huge. One commentator compared its brightness to that of a hand grenade going off. Even with a flash suppressor, it's an easy profile to make out, so the sniper will be vulnerable after having taken the shot. This is why the rifle is designed to engage targets at such long ranges. Such distance is one of the only ways to ensure a good level of safety for the sniper using it. Although it is notable that in a 2021 training video released by the Ukrainian military, the flash profile of the weapon was much lower when it was equipped with a silencer. The arrival of the alligator and T-Rex on the battlefield shows that the role of the sniper continues to evolve. Ranges are getting longer, with the record for the longest recorded sniper kill changing hands more frequently in the last decade. Anti-material snipers have also shown their importance in modern peer or near-peer conflicts. Precision missiles, artillery shells, and rocket-based anti-tank or anti-aircraft munitions get depleted rapidly under such conditions, with both sides in the conflict suffering from a shortage. Users will therefore need to be careful in how they decide to use their sophisticated precision ammunition. The response to this reality has been to go retro. In many other ways, old is new. For example, Ukrainian forces have relied on old-style flak cannons to shoot down Iranian Shahed drones, because using sophisticated missiles to do so is an uneconomical use of resources. The alligator demonstrates the same principle against targets on the ground. The sniper will always be a danger to enemy personnel, especially against high-value targets who aren't being careful. However, it is in the anti-material role that snipers of the later 21st century might see their most effective use. Will the snipers of the future, armed with weapons like the alligator, prove to be a danger to increasingly more expensive pieces of enemy equipment for cheaper prices? Don't forget to let us know what you think about this weapon and what the future of the sniper is. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. Putin has been targeting Ukrainian cities and its civilians since the beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian war, and recently it's gotten worse. President Volodymyr Zelensky has been upgrading Ukraine's air defense system as quickly and efficiently as possible. But here's the problem. Air defense is super expensive and supply of ammunition is limited. Thankfully, Ukraine's Western allies are on it. Germany recently announced it would be resupplying Ukraine with 45 Gepard or Cheetah anti-aircraft tanks by the end of the year to aid in its defensive struggle against Putin. These tanks are designed to destroy low-flying targets and are much cheaper to operate than other air defense systems like the US-made Patriot. Will they be able to protect Ukraine's critical infrastructure and civilian targets from Putin's missiles and drones? Ever wondered why Putin is targeting civilians in the first place? Here's the thing. In parallel with Ukraine's growing battlefield dominance, Russia has had a more difficult time attacking Ukrainian military units. One of the few ways that Putin has chosen to fight back has been to launch massive and continual waves of missile and drone attacks at Ukrainian cities. It cannot be understated how villainous these attacks have been. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR, estimates, over 9,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed as of June 2023, and more than 15,000 wounded from these and other Russian attacks. Those numbers, though tragic, are dwarfed by Ukraine's own estimates. They say that the civilian death toll in the invasion so far is closer to 100,000 killed, more than 10 times the official number released by the United Nations. For their part, the UN has admitted that the real numbers of civilian casualties will undoubtedly be higher than what they can confirm. Many of these deaths have come from the thousands of missiles and drones that Russia has used to target Ukrainian civilian targets, both infrastructure such as elements of their electrical grid, as well as apartment buildings, hospitals, shopping areas and schools. As of early July 2023, Brigadier General Oleksiy Romov 
deputy chief of the general staff of Ukraine, reported that close to 5,000 missiles have been fired at Ukraine, with almost 3,500 of those strikes carried out on populated areas. To be able to defend themselves from such attacks, Ukraine has received some of the best Western-made surface-to-air missile systems, including at least two batteries of the very capable US-built Patriot missile systems, which have helped protect Ukraine's capital Kyiv from advanced Russian ballistic missiles. A third battery has been promised by the Netherlands, but its arrival is not expected until later in 2023. The challenge of using the Patriot system is in reserving its expensive missiles to shoot down the more advanced and harder-to-target Russian missiles. Ukraine can't use their Patriot batteries to shoot down every missile and drone that Russia launches, and Russia has been relying more and more on the much cheaper, Iranian-made Shahed-136 drone, which costs a fraction of the $4 million per missile that a Patriot battery fires. Estimates are that the Shahed-136 drones currently being deployed by Russia cost as little as $20,000 to make, even using other surface-to-air missiles like Ukraine's Soviet-era S-300 SAM systems and fighter-launched interceptor missiles can cost Ukraine between $140,000 and $500,000 per launch. In just one night, July 7, 2023, Russia launched 18 Shahed drones from the city of Primorsk Aktarsk in the region of Krasnodar Krai. Ukrainian defenses managed to destroy 12 of the drones, but six still got through. Because of the vast numbers and lower costs of some of Russia's attacking drones, Ukraine has had to make use of less expensive systems to shoot down these attackers. One of the best responses to these attacks has been the use of an overlooked piece of military hardware, one that's been discontinued by its original manufacturer as being too out of date for the fast-paced environment of modern warfare, but which has still made a huge impact on the Ukrainian battlefield and has been responsible for saving hundreds, if not thousands of lives, the 1960s-era Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft system from Germany. Let's take a look at why this Cold War-era piece of military hardware was and still is a total badass. Here's how it started. Anticipating a possible war between NATO and the Soviet Union, Germany began development of the Gepard, the German word for cheetah, in the late 1960s based on the hull of the Leopard 1 main battle tank. The initial design requirements were for a mobile anti-aircraft system to counter low-flying Soviet fighter bombers. Drones hadn't even been anticipated back then, but fleets of Soviet ground attack aircraft were definitely considered a threat. Between the beginning of production in 1973 and the late 1980s, when the Gepard was discontinued in favor of more advanced designs, Germany built 420 hulls and about 430 turrets. The Gepard is equipped with a pair of quick-firing Erlikon 35mm cannons, which can each fire 550 rounds per minute. Putting a stream of lead like this into the sky has been an effective way of countering the Shahed drones, and their lower overall cost per system, compared to other more expensive SAM systems like the Patriot or S-300, means Ukraine can deploy more and more of them over a wider area of the country providing air defenses to smaller cities like the recently struck Lviv. One of the reasons the Gepard can defeat these drones is because of their integrated radar systems, which have a reported range of more than 10 miles. Designed to track Soviet-era fighters and bombers, they work even better against the more sluggish Iranian drones. The Gepard can fire a variety of ammunition, including armor-piercing discarding Sabot tracer rounds high-explosive incendiary tracer rounds, and advanced hit efficiency and destruction rounds. Depending on the ammunition they're firing, Gepard cannons can hit targets more than 3.5 miles away. Ukraine began using the first Gepards around August of 2022. They were first reported officially on the Ukrainian Weapons Tracker Twitter account on August 25th, though they may have been in the country earlier and just not officially acknowledged before then. As of June 2023, Germany has sent at least 34 Gepards to Ukraine and has agreed to send another 15 more in the coming weeks. Germany has promised a further 30 Gepards will be delivered before the end of the year. In addition, other countries that have bought Gepards in the past from Germany are in talks to send more of the systems, including Jordan, which operates around 40 Gepards. As soon as the Gepards were in country, they were rushed to the front lines almost immediately and proved effective at downing low-flying Russian cruise missiles and drones. They have been particularly effective against the Shahed-131 and 136 drones that Russia has been using against Ukraine's civilian population and their energy infrastructure. Because of the relative simplicity of the system, Ukrainian crews have been able to successfully operate the Gepard after only two months of training, compared to the German standard of 18 months. 
one crew around Odessa reportedly downed 10 Shahad drones and two cruise missiles in a single day. Inexpensive and simple-to-operate anti-aircraft systems like the Gepards bridge an important gap in Ukraine's air defenses, which includes long-range systems like the Soviet-era S-300 and Buck surface-to-air missile systems, as well as Western-made systems like NASAMS, a jointly produced mid-range air defense system made by the US firm Raytheon and Norway's Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace, along with the previously mentioned US-built Patriot batteries. Missiles fired by those systems are more advanced, but those advances come at a much higher price, and their construction takes much longer to build. These two constraints mean that the missiles used by these systems are relatively few in number. Those advanced missiles are also Ukraine's main defense against Russia's fast, high-flying fighters and bombers, and their high-tech caliber cruise missile. Ukrainian forces can't afford to use them against every drone and cruise missile because Gepards are designed to destroy low-flying targets and the ammunition is much cheaper, they can engage the drones and missiles for which the more expensive systems aren't a good match. There's only one problem with Ukraine's use of the Gepards. The ammunition is made by the gun's manufacturer, the Swiss company Erlikon. But Switzerland, attempting to maintain its neutrality, has so far been reluctant to allow ammunition to be sold to Ukraine. As of May 2023, the Swiss were still blocking a proposed sale of Gepard ammunition by Germany to Ukraine. As the producer of that ammunition, Switzerland has the right to oversee any sales of that ammunition by countries that have bought it from them. But Norway, newly accepted into NATO, has indicated that it might be willing to send some of their ammunition to Ukraine, while Germany has indicated they might be able to create a new production line to create the ammunition inside their country, with Switzerland's permission thus bypassing Switzerland's concerns about their neutrality. More recently, some cracks have begun to appear in Switzerland's icy freeze on supplying lethal aid to Ukraine. In early May 2023, the two houses of the Swiss parliament voted to amend the Military Materials Act to allow the transfer of military equipment to Ukraine in the future. This may allow not just the sale of Gepard ammunition, but the possible transfer of some of Switzerland's German-made Leopard 2 tanks as well. In the meantime, Ukraine's allies have been able to source ammunition from other countries. Germany has reportedly acquired ammunition from a Norwegian supplier, since Germany had itself only around 60,000 shells in the opening months of the invasion. The US has also found a new source of both the Gepards and its ammunition from the country of Jordan. The US paid an intermediary, Global Military Products Incorporated of Tampa, Florida, to purchase some of Jordan's Gepards, which may have originally come from the Netherlands. These behind-the-scenes wheeling and dealing should keep Ukraine well supplied with both the systems and the ammo needed to operate them, at least until either Switzerland relents and allows the sale of the ammo to proceed or when a new manufacturing plant for the ammunition is established outside of Switzerland's borders. Ukrainian data shows that in May 2023, Russia attacked Ukraine with a record monthly total of more than 300 drones, nearly all of them Iranian Shahed-type drones. But by the end of July, that number may be eclipsed, as Russia is ramping up its use of the low-cost attack weapon. On June 2nd, Ukraine managed to shoot down 36 Russian missiles and drones in and around the capital of Kyiv overnight, with two people injured by falling debris from the intercepted weapons. To counter this growing threat, Ukraine is working on more technologically advanced methods to stop them, from jamming their targeting systems to intercepting them with defending drones. To provide an idea of how quickly Ukraine is reacting to the drone threat, there were seven companies able to sell drones to the country's military soon after Russia's invasion began. By July of 2023, that number had risen to 40. And by the end of 2023, the number of Ukrainian companies able to produce military drones, both offensive and defensive, will reach 50. But as promising as these new efforts are, a reliable version of their products may be months or years away. For right now, one of the best options Ukraine has available to it is the Gepard. It's already a low-cost platform, it's been a proven drone defeater, and it's available in good numbers right now. The more Gepards Ukraine can purchase or have donated to them from other countries, the better off their cities and their people will be. So what do you think? Will the Gepards be able to protect from Putin's drones until Ukraine builds up its counteroffensive? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Russia's Su-57 – Putin's first stealth fighter in service since December 2022 – has been through a roller coaster of development woes and skepticism. 
Yet, despite its impressive tech, doubts remain about its true capabilities, especially its stealthiness. So, what's the deal with its long road to completion, and can it really slip under the radar like it claims? Let's dive in. Tom Cruise is no stranger to impossible missions. For several decades, perhaps with a bit of assistance from the Hollywood Special Effects Department, he has been fighting bad guys in fast-moving action sequences on sea, land, and in the air. In 1986, in the film Top Gun, he piloted a state-of-the-art fourth-generation US F-14 Tomcat against fictional Russian MiG-28s. In 2022, he returned to the cockpit of the by-now-out-of-date F-14 to dogfight against fifth-generation advanced Russian fighters. Cruz, in the guise of ace fighter pilot Pete Mitchell, manages to shoot down two enemy aircraft. He downs one of them the old-fashioned way, with a burst of cannon fire. Another member of his squadron manages to account for another one. In this second version of the film Top Gun, the plane the movie directors chose to represent the bad guys was a real aircraft, the Russian Su-57 single-seat multi-role stealth fighter. Since its original maiden flight back in 2010, this is a plane so rarely seen in the skies that it might almost be a fictional aircraft. Ironically, if Maverick and his buddies had shot down three Su-57s in real life, that would have probably accounted for the entire Russian serviceable fleet of stealth fighters. Joking aside, Russia's Su-57 fighter is Russia's first attempt to join a very exclusive club of nations, those that can boast a stealth fighter within their air force. Information is always a little bit hazy around Russian military equipment. We think the Su-57 officially became operational in December 2020. Until then, it was only China and the United States that had stealth fighters. The Su-57 has had a painful and protracted birthing process that has spanned decades, cost billions of rubles, and seen two of the aircraft written off in accidents before it was operational. It may have been used in combat against Ukraine in the last couple of years, but we only have the claims of the Kremlin and little in the way of independent confirmation. But the Su-57 certainly seems to be a high-tech and capable aircraft, and Western analysts have been taking a keen interest in its development. So why has it taken so long to develop? And is it any good? And perhaps more to the point, is it stealthy? Before we get to that, let's start with what seemed to be a promising origin story. Founded by Pavel Shukhoi in 1939, the Shukhoi Design Bureau has developed a long and proud tradition of producing combat aircraft in the service of first the Soviet Union and then Russia. Shukhoi produced fighter and ground attack aircraft during the Second World War. From 1945 onwards, the company embraced the new challenges in technologies offered by the arrival of the jet engine, producing fighters, bombers, and reconnaissance aircraft. Shukhoi also branched out into civilian aircraft. In 2006, the Russian government merged several aircraft companies into the United Aircraft Corporation. Shukhoi was part of this merger, alongside Mikoyan, Tupolev, Ilyushin, and several other legendary Russian aircraft designers and manufacturers. And thus, the development of the Su-57 began. Here's how it went down. Almost as soon as a new piece of high-technology military equipment comes into service, designers and planners are already looking ahead and thinking about its replacement. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union was looking ahead for the next generation of combat aircraft to provide the fighters of the 1990s and beyond. The concept was to have an aircraft capable of a range of tasks, able to attack targets in the air, on the land, and at sea. Experimental projects were initiated and some fell by the wayside amid cost increases and program delays. One fighter prototype only took to the air in 2000 and was, at that point, nine years behind schedule. The Russian Defense Ministry started afresh and in 1999 released a new set of requirements for a fighter aircraft that could, for cost reasons, replace both the MiG-29 and the Su-27, both sizable fleets of aircraft. It was intended that the aircraft should be smaller than its predecessors as well, to fit in with limited budgets. The Shukhoi development team took part in the invitation to submit proposals. It came down to a competition between Shukhoi and MiG. In April 2002, Shukhoi was selected and invited to produce prototypes, with an intended flying trial date somewhere in 2007. At the time, the aircraft design had a prototype name of the T-50. Shukhoi themselves are speculated to have used the American F-22 Raptor as a baseline guide for their design of a stealth fighter. The Shukhoi aspiration was for a family of stealth aircraft to emerge out of the Su-57 design work. Because much of the technology was very new, as the design of the aircraft proceeded, other aircraft were used as testbeds for aspects of the T-50, such as the weapons bays, engines, and flight control systems. 
Shukhoi made use of their own Su-27 multi-role fighter for this, and even retained some of these innovations on the Su-27 to make an upgraded Su-27. This proved so successful that the Russian Defense Ministry bought this new Su-27 version and renamed it the Su-35. The Su-35 is actually quite similar to the Su-57, apart from the stealth aspect, which the Su-57 reportedly has and the Su-35 does not. The project started to come together. The basic design was approved in 2004, and this triggered the release of more Defense Ministry funding into the project. In August 2007, the Russian Air Force announced the development was complete and that trials would soon be starting. The Soviet Union and Russia have marketed their military hardware all over the world. A fifth-generation stealth fighter aircraft would be no exception. Getting a large overseas order early on would take the financial pressures of the Su-57 project. India had bought much Russian military equipment in the past, and expressed very strong interest in acquiring the Su-57. There was talk of potential sales of two or three hundred aircraft. A deal was signed between Russia and India in 2010. But this is where cracks literally started to emerge in the program. A dozen flying and non-flying prototypes had been produced. Although flight testing and the maiden flight were due to begin in 2007, the flights were delayed. There were problems with the engines, flying trials were pushed back to 2010, and when they did take place, it soon became apparent that the airframe structure had significant problems. Stress cracks were appearing after only a few flights. The Shukhoi designers scrambled to find solutions and had to implement some major design adjustments in order to reinforce the basic aircraft structure. In June 2014, one of the prototypes caught fire just after landing. Although the pilot escaped unharmed, the aircraft was written off. Some of the parts and components were cannibalized for use with the other prototypes. The original plan had been to start delivering production versions of the Su-57 from 2015. This clearly was not going to happen. The delivery date slipped to 2020. During these unforeseen difficulties, the Russian government began to reassess and reduce its purchasing plans for the aircraft. The Russian Defense Ministry would buy 52 Su-57s by 2020 and then another 150 by 2025. But the program remained troubled, as purchasing plans and delivery dates all fluctuated. After Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea from Ukraine in 2014 and the subsequent low-intensity conflict in eastern Ukraine fought by Russian-backed separatists and covert Russian forces, international sanctions began to impact on Russian finances. The Russian defense industry relied on importing high-tech Western electronics and other equipment. These important components became harder to access on the open market. Sanctions were to become even tougher when Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. India started to back away from the big purchase order of Su-57s and in 2018 cancelled the deal completely. Large-scale production of what was a very expensive aircraft was now looking very doubtful. But in 2019, Russian President Vladimir Putin jumped in to tip the scales, perhaps even with his eye on a coming war with Ukraine. In May, the Kremlin released a statement that 76 Su-57s would be bought and would be delivered by 2028, but production of the aircraft remained slow. Reportedly, one was made in December 2020, and another four had emerged by the middle of 2022. Despite the problems, the aircraft had now flown publicly at air shows, and analysts had been able to take a look. The aircraft was light, maneuverable, and agile. Commentators were impressed. Marketing brochures and Kremlin official statements hyped up the capabilities, not least the fact that it was a stealth aircraft with long-range strike capability. But good intelligence analysts try not to take anything for granted. If it could do everything that the brochure advertised, the Su-57 would represent a very credible opponent for current US and NATO frontline fighter aircraft, such as the Eurofighter Typhoon, the F-22 Raptor, and the F-35 Lightning. But one former US pilot, Riley, observed, is it a current threat? Well, not now, because there is only one of them. Another ex-pilot observing the smooth takeoff and acrobatics of an Su-57 at an air show was impressed but slightly dismissive of the fancy aerial display designed primarily to please the tourists. He was more interested in how the aircraft would perform with a full load of fuel and a heavy payload of weapons. Despite Putin's apparent faith in the aircraft, on December 24, 2019, the first official production-grade aircraft crashed while being delivered to an airbase. The pilot ejected and survived. The cause is unclear, but is believed to have been some form of control system malfunction. So what sort of capabilities have been advertised for the Su-57? 
The aircraft stats look impressive, reporting a speed of Mach 2 to 2.1 and a ceiling of 20,000 meters. A high fuel carrying capacity appears to give it a much longer range, 1,500 kilometers, just under 1,000 miles, than its Su-27 counterpart. It also has the option to fit an extendable refueling probe to further increase the range. Later production models are intended to receive a newly designed engine, the Isdalai 30, to deliver more power and performance. The Su-57 is capable of supercruise, maintaining flight speeds beyond Mach 1 without having to use high-fuel expensive afterburners. The Su-57 has six radars to enhance pilot situational awareness. The N036 Bielka radar has a range of 400 kilometers. The F-16, about to be received by Ukraine, only has a range of 300 kilometers. It can carry many different permutations of weapon types, missiles, cruise missiles, and bombs, enabling it to strike at ground, sea, and air targets. A GSH 30mm automatic cannon provides a small anti-air or air-to-ground attack capability. Apparently, hypersonic missiles are being designed with the Su-57 in mind. The infrared search and tracking system can handle multiple targets. But let's spend a little bit of time thinking about the main selling point for the Su-57 its stealth capability. Inevitably, these specialist skills are closely guarded state secrets, but we can make a few observations. A stealth aircraft is simply an aircraft that has been designed to make it harder for radar to hit the aircraft and bounce back to the radar receiver and produce a ping or a blip on the radar screen. This can be achieved with several careful shaping features to the plane's outline. The Su-57 aircraft has incorporated many measures indicative of stealth capability. The wing and control surfaces are carefully shaped and angled. For stealth missions, the weapons are carried in four internal weapons bays, rather than hanging off the outside of the aircraft, which would make the aircraft more radar visible. Large parts of the aircraft surface are treated with radar-absorbing material RAM. A key search and track sensor faces backwards when not in use, with the forward edge treated with RAM. The pilot canopy has been prepared with a metal oxide coating to reduce the radar profile. Extra care has been paid to every aspect of the assembly of the aircraft. Every rivet has to be flush with the fuselage or otherwise concealed. When assessing an aircraft's stealth capability, the experts talk of a radar cross-section. They mean what aircraft profile is visible to a radar system. By one estimate, the Su-57's radar cross-section, or RCS, is 30 times smaller than that of the Su-27. But some Western analysts suggest that although the frontal radar cross-section may be reasonably effective, the profile from the rear looks to be less well concealed. This would mean that it's probably harder to pick up on the radar if it's coming straight at you, but it might be more visible from the side or the rear. A crucial selling point for military hardware is whether you can point to a credible track record of military success. The Su-57 does not have this. Or does it? It's actually quite difficult to give a definitive answer. The Russian Defense Ministry has claimed that the Su-57 has been used in action in Syria and in Ukraine. This is hard to verify, but let's take a look at what we do know. Our journey begins in Syria. In late February of 2018, two Su-57s reportedly landed at the Kamaimim military airbase on Syria's Mediterranean coastline. Kamaimim is directly adjacent to the Basal al-Assad International Airport and, since 2015, has been effectively handed over to the Russians as part of their military operation in support of the Assad regime. It's well defended by Russian military personnel and air defense systems, and is a key logistics and accommodation node for Russian forces. The base has come under attack from shelling and drones in 2018. The Su-57s came accompanied by other aircraft, including Su-25s and 35s. Depending on the route taken, this could have been a flight of 1,000 kilometers or so, providing a good flight trial in its own right. It's possible that another couple of Su-57s also arrived at Kamaimim a few days later. What the Su-57s did there is unclear. It may simply have been a public relations exercise to demonstrate Russian capabilities and global reach. The aircraft were only there for a few days. After they departed, the Russian government made reference in March to Su-57 combat trials in Syria and claimed on 25th of May that an Su-57 had fired a cruise missile in combat. Later that year, the Russian Defense Ministry released footage of the Su-57s in flight and stated that 10 flights had taken place. It seems highly likely that the Su-57s dipped their toes into the Syrian conflict, but overall, this looks more like a PR stunt than a serious military deployment. Okay, but what about Ukraine? 
Russian claims that the Su-57 has been active during the invasion of Ukraine have been more persistent, but equally difficult to prove. Although it might seem a bit of a no-brainer that the Russian military would want to use their best aircraft in a large-scale war on their border, using the Su-57 over Ukraine would be fraught with military and reputational dangers. According to estimates, there are perhaps 10 to 15 Su-57 aircraft in total. It's fair to assume that not all of these would be operationally ready at any one point in time. This amounts to a very small potential strike force and one that could not realistically afford to lose more than one or two in combat. Multiple Russian sources started claiming that the Su-57 was used in action during the war, from two or three weeks after the start of the invasion. On 22nd of June 2022, Russian state media referred to the Su-57 combat operations in relation to Ukraine. On the 5th of November 2023, Russian media claimed that the Su-57s had been active over Luhansk, a region of Russian-controlled eastern Ukraine. Perhaps more credibly, the British Ministry of Defense Intelligence Group have assessed that the Su-57 has almost certainly been used in the war. Okay, so what could this mean? The Russian Air Force has suffered catastrophic losses during its invasion of Ukraine, according to plausible estimates. Well over 300 aircraft from a Russian Air Force operational strength pre-war of around 900 aircraft. The Ukrainian air defense system has greatly improved during the conflict and now presents a very effective shield against Russian aerial encroachment. This looks likely to have caused the Russian Air Force to limit the amount of aircraft it risks to actually fly over Ukrainian territory. It is likely that US and NATO intelligence-gathering aircraft operating over NATO or international airspace in Eastern Europe are scooping up as much information as possible regarding Russian air deployment activities and operations and relaying this to the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. Many Russian air attacks are now conducted from Russian aircraft firing long-range missiles from Russian airspace. But even this does not make them entirely safe. Ukrainian air defense weapons include the Patriot, which has a range of 50 to 100 miles. Drones and other missiles also put Russian aircraft at risk on their bases inside Russia. So it's likely that Russia is remaining highly cautious with the Su-57 over Ukraine, not wishing to overplay their hand and expose it to undue risk. From what we've seen so far, the Su-57 is being used to undertake just enough aerial activity to be able to claim operational experience, but not enough to use it in a serious way that might knock out key Ukrainian military targets by using its stealth capability. If an Su-57 crashed in Ukraine, it would be a major propaganda blow for Russia and potentially a rich source of technological and tactical intelligence information made available to the Ukrainians and their Western allies. The views from the Ukrainian military suggest they certainly do not rule out the possibility that the Su-57 has been deployed in some way. One Ukrainian colonel observed that it's hard to identify specific aircraft types from the radar screen. The Su-25 and Su-35 can conduct similar non-stealth attacks with a similar profile. The colonel may know a little more than he's letting on. Perhaps the only real proof that a Russian stealth fighter was operating over Ukraine would be if a Ukrainian ground target suddenly exploded and the Ukrainians were at a complete loss to explain who had done it. That would be the perfect demonstration of a stealth attack. Conversely, however, if a Russian stealth attack was seen on the radar and easily intercepted, the Su-57's credibility would be instantly blown. So the question is, does Mr. Putin feel lucky? One thing's for sure, it's been a troubled path for Shukhoi's fifth-generation stealth fighter, and unfortunately for Russia's Su-57 program, it looks to be having very similar problems to the Russian T-14 next-generation main battle tank program, which we covered in one of our previous episodes. Both projects have struggled with design issues, have little to show for several decades of effort, and are now struggling with funding, technology, and a lack of crucial overseas sales. There are very few, only handfuls really, of the equipment known to be in existence and no convincing demonstrations that either the aircraft or the tank are operationally ready in any meaningful sense. But work is still ongoing. Shukhoi is developing an Su-57 upgrade known as the Su-57M. Flight trials of the Su-57M reportedly took place in 2022. There has been talk of a smaller naval version capable of landing on an aircraft carrier but Russia does not have a viable carrier force at present. Perhaps of more immediate interest, in July 2021, there was reporting that a two-seater variant of the Su-57 was being built. This was described as a training version, but also something that might provide for a weapons officer to operate unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. Drone technology is causing something of a revolution in military affairs, due in large part to the innovations emerging from the Ukrainian battlefield. 
this is definitely something to keep an eye on. There is little concrete evidence that the international arms community have been wowed by the arrival of the Su-57. Although international sanctions are unlikely to shut down the Su-57 program, lack of critical technology, funds, and buyers will likely continue to restrict the forward progress of the Su-57 project. Potential sales opportunities still look limited. Brazil dropped out in 2013, preferring to buy the Swedish Gripen and build it in Brazilian factories. India cancelled its deal with Russia over five years ago and is looking to build its own homegrown stealth fighter. Turkey was briefly interested. In 2019, an Su-57 turned up at a Turkish technology display in Istanbul, but announced in early 2020 that it too was now planning to build a homegrown stealth fighter. Algeria may receive some in a few years' time, and Iraq has expressed interest, but they will probably be watching Ukraine closely for evidence of the much-promoted stealth capability. But not all technological innovations leap straight from the drawing board and into a fully functioning and successful piece of equipment. We suggest that it would be too simplistic to write off the Su-57. It is a light, powerful, and agile aircraft with significant capabilities beyond other current Russian combat aircraft. And some of the new design and technological features that emerged from Shukhoi's extensive development efforts seem to have cascaded down to the benefit of other Russian fighter systems. So perhaps we need to wait and see what happens later this year. F-16 fighters have been offered to the Ukrainian Air Force by Denmark and Norway. These will replace the aging Ukrainian MiG-29 and Su-27 fighters. Ukrainian pilots are already being trained on F-16s, and we may well see them take to the skies over Ukraine even as soon as this summer. But what do you think? Is it possible the Russian Air Force is holding back its small Su-57 fleet in anticipation of a conflict with American aircraft technology? This would suddenly take us beyond a Hollywood movie and into a real contest between American fourth-generation aircraft and Russian fifth-generation. Is this likely to happen? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Imagine a non-guided aerial weapon, meticulously designed to unleash its power upon release from an aircraft. The MK-20, also called the CBU-100 Cluster Bomb, boasts a robust body crafted from top-notch aluminium, clocking in at just under 500 pounds. But what sets this weapon apart is what happens next. Once airborne, the container housing 247 heat submunitions, known as MK118, dramatically opens, causing them to rain down on a designated target zone with devastating force. Putin, are you scared yet? Well, you should be. Ukraine just asked the US for a bunch of these babies and its request has been generously granted. This, however, has been the subject of some controversy. But why? How is Ukraine using this weapon, and what could it mean for the war going forward? Let's find out. On Friday, July 7, 2023, the United States declared that it would be supplying Ukraine with cluster bombs, in a decision that President Joe Biden said had been a very difficult one to make. The move was controversial even among America's closest allies. The United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand, partners with the United States in the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, all said they were opposed to the move. Spain, a NATO ally, also declared its opposition. The United Nations Human Rights Office also opposed the measure and urged both sides in the war to stop the use of cluster bombs without delay. As mentioned, cluster bombs are dropped from a plane or delivered from an artillery shell, rocket or missile. The weapon begins as a single container. This container then breaks apart and releases many small bomblets indiscriminately over a wide area. Over 120 countries have banned the use of these weapons because of this indiscriminate nature, fearing the risks that they pose to civilians. The individual cluster bomblets that get released from the initial container also have a high rate of failure. Many of them are duds. These duds can then linger on the ground for decades and accidentally go off when somebody interacts with them. Cluster bombs therefore pose some of the same problems to civilians that landmines do. For example, the United States dropped 260 million cluster munitions in Laos as part of its operations in the Vietnam War. Over 60 years later, large tracts of land in Laos remain uninhabited because of unexploded cluster bomblets in the area. The United States and Russia are not parties to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. This treaty, which went into effect on August 1, 2010, bans the countries that adhere to it from using, acquiring, developing, stockpiling, and transferring cluster munitions. 
Countries involved in the convention are even prohibited from assisting other countries from interacting with cluster bombs in any way. They cannot help them manufacture their own cluster weapons, for example. Ukraine is not a signatory to the Convention on Cluster Munitions either, and in April 2023 at the Munich Security Conference, it requested the United States to deliver these weapons, which it has long desired. However, this desire could harm its international image, which up until this point was almost unanimously positive. Amnesty International and other human rights groups condemned the White House's decision to provide the Ukrainian military with cluster bombs, warning of the threat these weapons could pose to civilians during and after the war. United States National Secretary Advisor Jake Sullivan countered the controversy by declaring that the cluster bombs the United States would be sending to Ukraine failed at far less frequent rates than the versions that the Russians had already been using in the war. The United States has a domestic law on the books that bans the production, use or transfer of cluster bombs which have a failure rate greater than 1%. Sullivan said that American cluster munitions in question fail at less than 2.5%, compared to Russian bombs that have dud rates between 30 and 40%. Nevertheless, by admitting this, he also tacitly admitted that the Biden administration was disregarding the law. Russia's defense and foreign ministry were publicly unfazed by the announcement. They instead dismissed it as an act of desperation. In accepting delivery of the cluster bombs, Ukraine promised that it would not use them on Russian territory. There were other conditions too, which we'll get into in a moment. For Ukraine, a feeling of necessity surrounds the use of cluster bombs. At the beginning of July, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Valery Zaluzhny, admitted that the counteroffensive in Donbass and Zaporizhia that began in June was not making the progress that he had desired. He blamed the slow pace of the operations on a lack of adequate firepower, especially artillery and air support. General Zaluzny particularly complained about the lack of adequate fighter jets to provide air support, saying that the Western planes he wanted were a generation more advanced than the planes available to him. Ukraine has long desired cluster bombs to more effectively target Russian defenses, formations of tanks and armored vehicles, and troop formations. Because cluster bombs focus their attack on a wide area, the Ukrainians would need less of them to destroy Russian assets, in comparison to the more narrowly targeted weapons Ukraine has been using. Ammunition expenditures would decrease and accuracy would become less important. Given Ukraine's shortage of the artillery shells it desperately needs if its counteroffensive is to make the headway at once, the delivery of American cluster bombs is a welcome one for Kyiv. A British general, Sir Richard Shiriff, NATO's former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, mentioned that the decision had utility. Arming the Ukrainians with cluster bombs, he said, would make it easier for them to break through Russian lines. He blamed the West for failing to provide adequate firepower early enough, therefore making the use of cluster bombs necessary now. The cluster weapon in question is the dual-purposed Improved Conventional Munition DPICM. This is an artillery shell that bursts apart and drops 88 separate bomblets over the target area. The cluster shell has a dud rate of around 3%, so its delivery would violate American law. In September 2022, General Zaluzny wrote an article requesting that the United States provide Ukraine with the DPICM, which is currently being phased out in the US Armed Forces in favor of the CDAEM cluster round, which has a dud rate of 1% or less, in line with American standards first set by the Obama administration. Note that this standard is different from the law which forbids the transfer of cluster munitions with a failure rate greater than 1%. The Ukrainian top general is now finally getting his wish. Another weapon the Ukrainians badly want is the airdropped Mark 20 Rock I-2 cluster bomb, also known as the CBU-100, which weighs about 500 pounds in total. It is a gravity bomb that, once released from the air, bursts apart into 247 separate Mark 118 bomblets that rain down over the designated target area. The target area's range can be adjusted based on the altitude that the original container is set to burst apart in. The Mark 118 bomblets are steered by fins at the back and have electrical and mechanical fuses that activate once they are released from the original CBU-100. Once the bomblets' noses hit a hard surface, the ordnance detonates. Reportedly, the Ukrainians do not want to use the Mark 20 Rock I-2 cluster bomb in its traditional way, because Ukraine already has better cluster-type weapons in its arsenal that can be delivered via HIMARS and other systems. The coming DPICM artillery shells add to this capability. Rather, the Ukrainians seem to want to dismantle the Mark 20 container and place the individual Mark 118 bomblets on drones. 
These bomblets are designed for maximum penetration against enemy armored assets. The shape of the design allows for puncturing of up to 190 mm of armor. The bomblets are also aerodynamically sound. These factors make them ideal candidates for drone operations against Russian armored formations. Ukraine has proven very effective in the practice of drone warfare. In May, it launched dozens of drone attacks to weaken the Russian lines in preparation for the counteroffensive it launched in Zaporizhia and around Bakhmut in June. Additionally, Ukraine has carried out drone attacks far beyond the Russian lines. Combining the drone capability with the wider area effect of a cluster bomb is something the Ukrainian military is very keen on trying, as it seeks any advantage it can find in the counteroffensive. The Mark 20's manufacturer, a company called Textron Systems, reportedly stopped making this weapon in 2016, following the United States' decision to discontinue sales of the bomb to Saudi Arabia. However, the United States has large stockpiles of the Mark 20 containers and the Mark 118 bomblets, more than enough to provide them in large numbers to the Ukrainian military. So far, the United States has not yet agreed to deliver this weapon to Ukraine. We will need to wait and see if that changes. Although neither the United States nor Ukraine joined the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the decision to use them has still created a lot of controversy among NATO members and other like-minded countries. The United States is by far its most important partner, but Ukraine still needs the support of these other nations which have signed the Convention on Cluster Munitions. These countries provide Ukraine with military and financial aid, and all of this help is needed. Therefore, Ukraine will probably want to be careful in how it uses the cluster munitions when they arrive on the battlefield. So where would the Ukrainian military use these weapons and where would it be less likely to use them? Ukraine will probably want to use its new cluster artillery shells in areas where its counteroffensive has stalled. This would be in Zaporizhia, in the drive toward the city of Tokmak. Perhaps anticipating this, Russian reports suggest that Ukrainian troops had already struck areas near Tokmak, the probable initial objective for Ukraine on the Zaporizhia front, with cluster munitions on July 11th, although the Institute for the Study of War could not independently verify this. As of July 15th, the front line in Zaporizhia extends from the Dnieper around Kamyansk to Novopil opposite Lyubmivka. All of these sectors could prove enticing targets for cluster bomb attacks, because a breakthrough in Zaporizhia Oblast would put Ukraine in position to cut the Russian land bridge to Crimea. It is a highly strategic area. Ukraine will want to affect that breakthrough any way it can, and the Russian defenses there are heavier than anywhere else on the front. This is part of why Ukraine has made such slow progress in the counteroffensive so far. If there is one area where we can probably bet to see the use of cluster bombs at the front, it would be there in Zaporizhia. Ukrainian forces may also wish to use the cluster bombs in Bakhmut, which has seen the heaviest fighting in the war, and which is another axis of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Ukraine is currently pushing towards Minkivka in the north and towards Ozaryanivka in the south. The Ukrainian units there hope to encircle Russian-occupied Bakhmut and cut the city off from supply lines further to the east. Finally, the Ukrainian military may seek to use its new cluster bombs to support special operations across the Dnieper River opposite Kherson. In deploying its new weapons, Ukraine could use them to disrupt Russian formations over a wider area than its current artillery shells do. Still, Ukraine would need to be careful that unexploded bomblets do not become de facto landmines that impede the movement of its own forces. On the other hand, the unexploded bomblets dropped on Russian lines could also protect the gains that Ukraine makes in its attacks. The area denial factor of these unexploded bombs then works against the Russians, making it harder for them to counterattack. In this way, it's possible to view the tendency toward a high dud rate as a feature of cluster bombs, rather than a bug. Cluster bombs dropped on strategic pieces of real estate like airports, approaches to river crossings, tactically important high ground and so on, act as improvised, rapidly deliverable landmines that slow down the operations of enemy forces. Every piece of ground Ukraine retakes could be protected with the unexploded bomblets of the cluster weapons it uses on Russian lines. Areas where Ukraine would more likely not want to deploy cluster bombs would be in sectors with even marginal civilian populations. Indeed, one of the terms of the deal that Ukraine made with the Biden administration was an assurance that the American-made cluster bombs would not be used in areas near where civilians are present. This could mean that the artillery batteries equipped with the cluster rounds are less likely to fire near occupied villages but in the zones between them. All wars are first and foremost political. 
and large numbers of civilian casualties that come as a result of Ukrainian-deployed cluster bombs would risk undermining the global support that Ukraine has managed to build since Russia's invasion. One of the many reasons why Russia has been condemned for its conduct in the conflict is through its own use of cluster bombs. In early March 2022, human rights groups accused Russia of using cluster bombs in civilian areas. One such attack wound up hitting a school in Kharkiv, the second biggest city in Ukraine. The attack killed three civilians, including a child. Although Russia has not ratified the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the attack was still considered a war crime. The move was similar to some of Russia's accused tactics in the Syrian civil war, where cluster bombs were also used, including against civilian targets. In July 2022, Amnesty International came out with a more detailed report, accusing Russia of killing hundreds of civilians in the Kharkiv area through indiscriminate shelling and the use of cluster bombs. The weapons in question were the 9N210 and the 9N235 cluster bombs and scatterable mines that eject from smaller rockets. These mines explode at timed intervals once released. Investigators from Amnesty International looked at 41 strike sites in Kharkiv that resulted in the deaths of 62 civilians and the wounding of 196 more. They said that using these weapons is tantamount to deliberately targeting civilians. This is a violation of international humanitarian law, despite Russia's not being a party to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Russia's use of cluster bombs in Ukraine goes much further than the strikes in Kharkiv. Regions all over Ukraine have been targeted with these weapons. Russia has never denied using cluster bombs and has been rather keen to point out NATO's use of its own cluster bombs in the Balkans in 1999. Russia has been a fierce critic of the Convention on Cluster Munitions, saying that these munitions are legitimate weapons which have not been banned by international humanitarian law and play a significant role in the defense interests of Russia. It is in incidents such as these that Ukraine's desire for cluster bombs becomes more understandable. If Russia has already used cluster bombs, Ukraine naturally would see no problem with retaliating in a similar way. Despite the history of Russian cluster bomb use, Sergei Shoigu, Russia's Minister of Defense, threatened escalation, saying that Russian would use similar weapons if American cluster bombs wound up being used in the war. Ukraine, for its part, had also used cluster bombs prior to the Biden administration's decision to deliver more of them to the conflict. As early as 2014, Ukraine was using the Soviet-era cluster bombs it had inherited in the Donbass region against pro-Russian separatist forces, although Ukraine denied that it was doing so back then. The new American-made cluster bombs should be a much better performing round than Ukraine's previous stockpiles. General Zaluzny had been very keen on getting his hands on the DPICM. In his September 2022 interview, he stated that it is a much more effective round than the high-explosive artillery shells the United States had been delivering to Ukraine. Unlike cluster ammunition, high-explosive shells hit a single point and explode. Although these impacts create shockwaves and thousands of high-speed shell fragments, the area of effect is much smaller than a cluster bomb. Although the United States has granted Ukraine DPICM artillery rounds, it has not yet granted the Mark 20 Rock I-2 or the Mark 118 bomblets that it drops. We will need to see if that changes. The Biden administration is probably hoping that it will not need to provide these weapons and risk further alienating international allies and partners. If the DPICM artillery rounds make enough of a difference in the counteroffensive, then there is less of a need to send more cluster bombs to Ukraine and contaminate the country with the duds. That is an important consideration for Ukraine's prospects both during and after the war. Although examples of Russian cluster bomb use in the current conflict abound, the Ukrainians will need to take heed of the example Russia has set. The first delivery of American cluster bombs to Ukraine was confirmed by the Pentagon on July 13. We must now wait and see how Ukraine exactly will use them on the battlefield and where it will do so. The answers will come shortly. Ukraine's new cluster bombs should prove more effective than the Soviet-era munitions it had been using. But more than any other weapon granted to Ukraine so far in the war, this type of munition divides Western opinion. Since securing Western support for the duration of its war with Russia remains the most important item on the strategic agenda for Ukraine, it will need to be more careful with how it uses cluster bombs than any other weapon in its arsenal. If it uses them in a reckless or less than discriminate way, it will risk undermining the Western support so vital for its war effort. The negative response of so many NATO allies to the news of the Biden administration's decision will undoubtedly provoke caution in the Ukrainian high command about how these weapons should be deployed. But what do you think? 
Is it a good idea to give Ukraine cluster bombs? Where would the Ukrainians use them in their offensive operations and how? Do you think they could change the course of the war? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. The famous phrase from former world heavyweight champion Mike Tyson certainly applies to both sides in the war in Ukraine. Now nearly two years old, both Russia and Ukraine have learned many hard lessons during the fighting. One of them is that ammunition gets depleted quickly in a modern conflict. Both sides have suffered shortages of missiles, artillery, and other modern instruments of war. The shortage of weapons and length of the conflict has forced both sides to find creative ways to keep themselves in the fight, including by using some unconventional weapons. Let's take a look at some of these arms, which range from the archaic to the very, very strange. One of the stranger weapons seen in this conflict is a variant of the KH-101 cruise missile, which was developed in Russia during the 1990s. The first pictures of its use surfaced in 2007, and the weapon entered service with the Russian Air Force in 2012. The KH-101 is a subsonic cruise missile launched from a bomber. It has a maximum speed of Mach 0.76, and can carry conventional warheads between 400 and 450 kilograms. It can also carry nuclear warheads up to 20 kilotons, the same yield as the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki at the end of World War II. The most formidable aspect of this cruise missile is its stealthy design. The KH-101 is designed for low visibility and to have a minimal cross-section on radar. It flies at low altitudes as well, sometimes as low as 30 meters further protecting it from radar observation. The missile can hit targets to an accuracy of less than 10 meters and has a range of 3,000 kilometers. The KH-101 has good precision features, as it's capable of striking targets in motion and can change its target if need be. The KH-101's guidance system, called the Oplesk U, is equipped with electro-optical features to correct its flight path and a TV guidance system for when it descends to hit its target. At first glance, this weapon does not seem strange. Precision missiles are an important part of modern warfare. International security experts had hoped that sanctions on Russia would prevent it from getting the components needed to manufacture such missiles. For a while, it looked like this might have been the case as the intensity of Russian missile attacks on Ukrainian cities deceased. However, 2023 has proven that Russia can still manufacture its cruise missiles at scale. Ukrainian troops have adapted to Russian cruise missiles and shot down a KH-101 in January 2023 in the Venetia region. This one surprised soldiers, though, as it came with features they had not seen before. The missile had a camera resting within a circular window, which Ukrainian authorities speculated was part of its Oplesk U guidance system. The camera had three fixed lenses, capable of observing its targets at different angles. In contrast, Earlier KH-101 missiles that had been shot down and recovered had cameras that only had a single swivel lens. Ukrainian military officials claimed that this upgraded KH-101 had a guidance system more similar to the United States DS-MAC Digital Scene Making Area Correlation, which has an internal database of relevant terrain imagery to help guide the projectile toward its target. This system can visually identify its targets to guide the projectile rather than relying on a purely mathematical framework. The ds Max system is placed on some versions of the Tomahawk. However, the stranger thing was the discovery that these new versions of the KH-101 could have onboard countermeasures. On one of the missile's sides, there were two columns of six small holes, which seemed capable of distributing countermeasures against threats such as chaff. X-rays taken of the missile confirmed that it had heated traps to guard against infrared targeting, Although without a significant set of surveillance cameras, it's impossible to try to counter these heat traps automatically. It is possible that a simple onboard radar warning receiver placed on the missile could trigger the chaff's deployment upon detection of pre-programmed radio frequency emissions, or the chaff could be automatically deployed on the predetermined points of vulnerability on the missile's flight trajectory. Either way, the equipment found in this wrecked KH-101 confirmed international fears that despite the sanctions, the Russian military was still capable of producing advanced cruise missiles. Other unusual weapons in Ukraine are far less spectacular. Attrition on both sides of the conflict has been high, with a consequent shortage of modern weapons and ammunition. 
This has forced both sides to look for ways to improvise. Most famously, Russia has lost over 2,500 tanks since the start of the war, and this pressure has forced it to break its Cold War relics, like the T-54 and 55, out of storage and onto the battlefield. However, some of the weapons in Ukraine are much older than this. Old doesn't necessarily mean ineffective, however. Russia and Ukraine have both made use of older anti-aircraft guns to defend their airspaces. There is a necessity behind this decision, as there is simply not enough advanced missile base ammunition to go around for modern surface-to-air missile systems. New weapons on the battlefield have also ironically made the older guns more relevant. Because drones and many new missiles fly relatively low and slow, the old flat cannon is becoming a more relevant weapon again. After all, using an expensive missile to shoot down a cheap drone is not the most economical use of resources. For example, archaic anti-aircraft guns are a good option for Ukraine to counter the Iranian-made Shahed-136 kamikaze drones that Russia has deployed in large numbers in the conflict. Experts at the Royal United Services Institute RUSI, assessed that in countering these drones and other loitering munitions, in general, gun systems are preferred over missiles where possible. Due to much lower cost per engagement and higher availability of ammunition compared with SAMs and manpads. The RUSI staff urged Western leaders to help make these anti aircraft guns more effective. For example, the Soviet and Russian self propelled anti aircraft guns such as Shilka and Tunguska have had trouble against the Shahed and other kamikaze drones because they fly too low, but the German Flak Panzer Gepard has proven highly effective against them. Should these older weapons be fitted with radar and laser rangefinders, they could be much more effective in shooting down the Shahed 136 and other cheap, low-flying drones without exhausting the much more precious stockpile of surface-to-air missiles. Ukraine's adoption of old-style flak cannons goes beyond defense, however. Using the flak cannon in an offensive fashion has proven equally effective. One of the more unusual uses of this type of weapon is in its tweaked use of the Soviet-era KS-19 anti-aircraft gun. This weapon was first introduced in 1947 and fires a 100 by 695 mm shell. Ukrainian troops are now mounting this gun on the back of ubiquitous civilian trucks, which allow them to be moved in and out of combat rapidly. Although old, Ukrainian troops are improvising with these guns in surprising ways. The gunners are equipping them with tablet computers and pairing these with drones. Once the drones are in the sky, they can track Russian targets on the ground. The drones then send back data to the gunners, who then fire upon them, thus adapting the anti-aircraft gun for an anti-infantry and anti-armor role. One artillerist involved in these operations, Sergeant Yevgeny Itvin, said that the process of modification was very simple. It's like a box with two antennas. You just put it on the gun, you put two antennas on the barrel, one on the edge of the barrel and the other on another side. Ukrainian forces are often paying for this KS-19 modification process with their own money, demonstrating the shortage of modern military equipment, but also their ingenuity and the relatively low cost of adapting these old anti-aircraft guns for modern purposes. According to Itvin and others, this process, which was first reported in November 2023, had already killed 1,000 Russian soldiers. This modified KS-19 gun is capable of hitting targets spread up to 328 feet apart, and it can kill dozens of enemy troops in a single blast, making good use of each shot of ammunition. Even older weapon systems have proven equally effective on the modern battlefield. One of the oldest weapons seen in use in Ukraine is the World War I-era M1910 Maxim machine gun which had its design origins in the 1880s. The belt-fed machine gun fires the type of 7.62 by 54 mm ammunition that has been in use in Russia since 1891, meaning that there are almost limitless rounds available for it. The machine gun is also water-cooled, making it versatile and durable compared to air-cooled machine guns, which often overheat, even in winter temperatures. In theory, an M1910 machine gun can fire indefinitely as long as it has access to water and ammunition. The Maxim machine gun is also surprisingly easy to modify for modern purposes. Ukrainian soldiers have been spotted placing modern optical equipment and camouflage on it, as well as a stock and suppressor. After seeing some use in early 2022, the M1910 Maxim reappeared in the Battle of Bakhmut. The weapon's main strength is to protect defensive positions, and this is how Ukrainian troops have used it. In Bakhmut, 
Ukrainian operators used it to mow down swathes of Russian attackers in scenes which harkened back to its World War I heyday. In this 21st century version of trench warfare, defenders can mount a series of M1910 Maxim guns, a remote-controlled rig that can spin 360 degrees. During the battle, video spread on TikTok of Ukrainian troops firing four of these machine guns at the same time, with each gun's ammunition belt fed from ammunition canisters strapped to a rig. One Ukrainian soldier said of the M1910 Maxim, it only works when there is a massive attack going on. Then it really works. The M1910 is not the only old weapon that has worked for Ukrainian troops. The DP-27 Degtyaryov light machine gun is another old automatic weapon being used by some units in Ukraine's reserve forces. This weapon was introduced in 1928 and was once called Stalin's record player, on account of the drum magazine mounted on top of it. Before the war, the Ukrainian Territorial Defense Forces were spotted with it near Kyiv. Once the invasion began, images circulated of units there defending the capital with this weapon. The DP-27 was, like many other Soviet weapons, designed to be reliable in extreme conditions, such as freezing temperatures and mud. The weapon is chambered for the ubiquitous 7.62 by 54 mm round, and the notable Pan magazine can hold a total of 47 rounds. It is capable of firing 550 shots per minute, which is lower than other, more modern machine guns. But since the DP-27 is air-cooled, the lower rate of fire reduces the chance for barrel overheating. Unlike some troops using other older weapons in the war, Ukrainian troops using the DP-27 have not seemed to complain about the weapon and remain in good spirits with it. One video circulating on social media in March 2022 showed one of the soldiers pretending to be a DJ with it and dancing to a tune with a smile on his face. Such small gestures often help to maintain morale and basic humanity under hellish conditions. In its defense of entrenched positions, the Maxim machine gun has proven itself useful in a modern setting, and the DP-27 seems to be good enough to fulfill its intended mission. However, other weird weapons in Ukraine have only made their appearance for a true lack of better alternatives. One of these weapons is the Mosin-Nagin bolt-action rifle, which saw widespread service in the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union from the 1890s until the end of World War II. Although the Mosin-Nagin exited active service in the late 1940s, it was still produced in Soviet factories until the 1970s. And because so many millions of these weapons were manufactured over nearly a century, they have been used during the war when the supply of modern weapons is short. In April 2023, Reuters reported that conscripts fighting in the separatist armies in the Donbass region lacked proper equipment and so were armed with the archaic Mosin-Nagin rifle. Images circulating on social media at the time also purportedly showed these troops carrying the Mosin-Nagin, though Reuters could not independently verify them. In July 2022, video surfaced of a Russian company commander complaining that his men too were using the 1944 variant of the Mosin-Nagin due to a shortage of equipment. A few months later, when Putin announced his partial mobilization and drafted 300,000 reservists, there were also reports that some of them were being issued the Mosin-Nagin instead of modern assault rifles. Given the other equipment shortages facing these troops in particular, such as a lack of proper body armor, the Mosin-Nagin's presence among some of these troops seemed consistent with what we know about Russian logistics. The Mosin-Nagin rifle has a clip of five 7.62 by 54 mm rounds. It's a bolt-action rifle, meaning the operator must cycle the bolt back to eject a spent cartridge and load the next one into the chamber. Bolt-action rifles are more accurate per shot than semi-automatic rifles or fully automatic assault rifles, which is why snipers still use them. For a frontline unit, however, it's not ideal, as these weapons have too slow of a rate of fire by modern standards. The issuance of this weapon to frontline troops had many war watchers calling them cannon fodder, a fact which many of the Russian conscripts agreed with. Separatist troops from Donbass have also been seen using the World War II-era PTRS-41 anti-tank rifle. This weapon was first brought into service in 1941 and fires a 145 by 144 mm armor-piercing round. During the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II, Soviet forces often mounted these guns on rooftops and fired down at the thinner turret armor of German panzers. Eighty years later, forces from Donetsk were seen with them, still carrying the nearly century-old ammunition cartridges as well. The PTRS-41 is a semi-automatic weapon, with the ammunition stacked in an overlapping pattern similar to the famous M1 Garand. 
making for a clip that attaches to the gun. Unfortunately for the operators of the PTRS-41, this design was not done as well as the American version, and it makes the weapon prone to jamming. There are scant reports about the PTRS-41's effectiveness against modern tanks. The separatist militias fighting alongside the Russian forces in Ukraine might be using it in a more general anti-material role. This weapon would be effective against more lightly armored vehicles and supply trucks at least. Widespread reports of the use of archaic small arms within the Russian and separatist forces indicate their trouble. However, things have not always been smooth for Ukrainian forces either. Ukraine has also been forced to break decades-old small arms out of storage since modern weapons are in such short supply. Another archaic weapon in the service of Ukraine is the TT-33 pistol, which entered into use for the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Since over a million of these weapons were manufactured during its service life, they are easy to find and break out of storage when required. The TT-33 is a semi-automatic pistol that comes with an 8-round magazine chambered for a 7.62 by 25 mm round. Both Russian and Ukrainian troops have been seen carrying this weapon in the conflict. One of the more interesting videos related to its use came from Ukrainian soldiers, attempting to test the steel plates in captured Russian body armor during the summer of 2022. Although the steel plate held against the TT-33's round, the pistol demonstrated that it could put significant deformation and cracks into the metal which would fail to protect the wearer from the energy imparted by the round. As many Russian troops do not even have this level of protection with their body armor, if indeed they have body armor at all, even the TT-33's low-caliber round poses a danger to Russian troops. Although there are understandably not many reports of pistols being used in this war, the lack of proper Russian body armor means that the TT-33 will be a threat to many of the Kremlin's soldiers, especially the conscripts, in close quarters. Ukraine has also been forced to improvise and create makeshift weapons on the spot. The country benefits from having a large population of engineers who know how to bootstrap. For example, the Ukrainians have turned shotguns into grenade launchers by attaching steel cups to the end of their barrels. Once the user is ready to fire, all one needs to do is pull the pin out of a conventional grenade and then tuck the munitions handle into the cup's wall. Then the user can load a cartridge into the shotgun that has been emptied of the normal pellets. The blank round projects the cup and grenade into the air, which releases the latter's handle and sends it on its explosive course. As one might expect, this is a dangerous method to launch a grenade, but with a shortage of modern weapons and ammunition, Ukrainian forces have often needed to make do with what they can get. Another makeshift innovation from both sides in the conflict includes a modification to the RPG-7. This weapon is normally a tank or a vehicle killer and not particularly effective against infantry. Not to worry, smart engineers amongst irregular forces have modified the RPG-7 launcher to fire 82mm mortar rounds with fragmentation warheads to spread their effects against infantry over a broader area. This method has been in use for a long time, starting even before the full-scale Russian invasion. Both forces in the earlier Donbass conflict had used the modified RPG-7 in this way. Ukraine has also used drones to give old weapons new life. For example, Ukrainian forces have modified the Soviet-era RKG-3 anti-tank grenade to be used with drones. The drones drop these grenades on the turret of a tank where the armor is thinnest. The RKG-3, which first entered Soviet service in the early 1950s, was originally designed with a drogue parachute, which opened up after a soldier threw it. This design was meant to help guide the munition onto the top of an enemy tank. However, this method is not ideal for drone use so Ukrainian engineers have removed the parachutes and added 3D-printed fins in their place. The fins stabilize the munition in its descent while also allowing it to fall faster than the parachute design did. The total cost for using the RKG-3 grenade in this new way is less than $100 per shot, making it an efficient weapon, especially given the vulnerabilities of Russian tanks if their turrets are struck. Similarly, Ukraine has requested that the United States send over the CBU-100 airdropped cluster bomb. The Ukrainians do not desire to drop the bomb from the sky so much as to separate its canister and drop the separate cluster bomblets on top of Russian armored assets via drones. Thus far, Washington has not granted the request. Necessity is the mother of invention, and war is the ultimate necessity. Whether it is through unusual high-tech weapons or putting ancient weapons to new uses or being forced to use antiques for lack of better substitutes, 
The war in Ukraine has forced both sides to innovate and adapt. As the war now drags on into its third year, what other inventions, innovations, and crude adaptations do you think both sides will employ as depletion of modern weapons further kicks in? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons for more military analysis from military experts. What does it take to fight off a superpower? When Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, many observers and analysts assumed the war would be over quickly. As Russian troops massed on the border, stormed into the country and laid siege to Kyiv, it seemed like only a matter of time until Vladimir Putin was in control of his smaller neighbor. But against the odds, Ukraine's armed forces defended their territory and began to win victory after victory. How did they do it? All year, social media has been filled with home videos of the many ways that soldiers and civilians alike have countered the bigger, better equipped Russian military. One of these has been repurposing salvaged equipment from defeated Russian forces, old Soviet leftovers, and even abandoned civilian homes. This has long been a tactic of underdogs in war, but here's how Ukrainians have taken the practice to a whole new level. Since the beginning of the conflict, large amounts of machinery have been left behind, captured, or shipped into the country. Now, in scenes resembling the weaponized steampunk vehicles from the movie Mad Max, Ukrainian soldiers have turned a range of civilian cars, trucks, tractors, and dune buggies into fearsome tools of combat. Armed to the teeth, these quickly constructed weapons have been inflicting some serious damage on Russian troops all year long. Valuable against both tanks and aircraft, they can function in nearly any condition, firing and racing away before they can be targeted. Civilian vehicles mounted with firepower are nothing new. In fact, they've been around almost as long as cars themselves. But the modern variety, known as technicals, were pioneered in places like Afghanistan, Libya, and Somalia during the 1990s. Originally a tool of armed groups without access to proper military hardware, they became a tool of governments during the early days of the US-led war on terror. US and British special forces began using technicals extensively to counter the Taliban in Afghanistan, as they could navigate places with little to no infrastructure. Gradually, the technical became a key part of special operations, while also retaining its value to less equipped forces. But with sufficient military hardware at their disposal, why are Ukrainian forces utilizing technicals? While most lack the armor of a tank, technicals are fast and cheap. This makes them perfect for waging asymmetric warfare against a stronger enemy. They also do well in hard-to-reach areas, since technicals are much easier to find parts for and repair than traditional military hardware like tanks or Humvees. The war has left Ukraine filled with vehicles, many perfect for conversion into these deadly machines. And while they've recently stepped up their efforts, the story of Ukraine's creative technicals goes all the way back to 2014. After Russia annexed Crimea that year, Ukraine's volunteer battalions began to assemble a fleet of homemade war vehicles. These were often put together in abandoned industrial warehouses. Using scrap metal and old Soviet parts, the battalions began to retrofit everything they could get their hands on in preparation for more Russian aggression. Many of their early models resembled reinforced tanks, focusing on extremely heavy armor over mobility to try and hold a precarious front line. But as the prospect of a full-scale invasion loomed, Ukraine's production of light technicals greatly increased. When full-scale war finally arrived, Millions fled their homes, fearing for their lives. The exodus left a huge collection of cars, trucks, tractors, and other automotives abandoned across the country. Many more modern vehicles were also donated from abroad, including armor-plated pickup trucks and SUVs. In the weeks after the invasion, dozens more small, crowd-funded factories were established inside and outside Ukraine's borders. There, volunteers attach weapons and armor plating to technicals and send them to the front line. While it can slow the cars down, the extra layer of armor on a technical is crucial as it can save those inside from shrapnel or other deadly hazards. Among the most successful of these retrofitting operations is Cars for Ukraine, run by Ivan Oleski, a 25-year-old esports analyst originally from Kherson. Started in March, his venture has created dozens of technicals from cars around Europe. They can purchase each truck for under $6,000 and quickly transform them into fearsome weapons of war. Each is also a statement of patriotic intent. Painted with a Ukrainian flag and a now popular slogan from early in the war, Russian warships, go f*** yourselves. 
But this is just one among dozens of operations, many of which are using extremely innovative designs for their technicals. While almost anything with wheels can be made into a technical, they have traditionally been constructed from light flatbeds and pickup trucks. Mitsubishi L200s are reportedly among the most desirable cars for technicals in the Ukraine along with the Ford Ranger and Toyota Hilux models. All of these are known for their durability and easy handling. This is crucial for quickly escaping enemy fire and navigating areas with unpredictable terrain and weather conditions. Ukrainian technicals have also been seen sporting a massive range of weaponry, including machine guns, drones, and multi-rocket launch systems. Many of these were taken from defeated Russian forces. This has led to some eye-catching results all across the internet. A recent taunting video from Ukraine's defense ministry shows a Russian helicopter rocket launcher attached to the back of one such Mitsubishi truck. In another instance, a dilapidated Soviet-era Volga sedan was mounted with a remote-controlled 14.5mm heavy machine gun. While both the car and machine gun are dated, they have been integrated with the modern remote control system. Clever designs like this have helped Ukraine reduce its battlefield casualties while inflicting substantial damage on the often unprepared Russian military. Another group of soldiers were filmed using an automatic Soviet 2B9 Vasilek 82mm mortar from the back of a farm truck. The Vasilek is usually based on a small, wheeled carriage and can rapidly fire armor-piercing shells with 75-gram warheads capable of penetrating 100mm of plating. While Soviet weapons like these are decades old, they can still dish out punishing firepower. This is especially true when mounted on a technical, giving the mortar far more versatility than the standard ground-based model. Others are more flashy, like this BMW technical, complete with a Ukrainian-themed paint job and truck-mounted machine gun. And it's not just domestic and Soviet-made weapons either. Western military support has also given Ukraine hundreds of powerful modern weapon systems like Stingers, Howitzers, and Javelin anti-tank missiles. Ukrainian soldiers have been making the most of this new equipment. One unit has been using a flatbed technical to transport mobile anti-aircraft teams armed with Stingers. After spotting a target, the soldiers can be seen quickly dismounting, firing, and returning to the vehicle to make their getaway. Another creative unit applied the tactic to the ground, making their Peugeot truck into a mobile hunter-killer anti-tank platform using javelins. The key feature of all of these models is their ability to quickly escape, before Russian artillery can target them with retaliatory strikes. But it doesn't end there. Recently, it seems that Ukrainian technicals have also moved beyond regular civilian vehicles. Pictures and videos have emerged of soldiers using heavily armored dune buggies, painted in dark green camo and studded with weapons. Several of these vehicles were recently seen near the strategic city of Izium, complete with Stugna P anti-tank guided missiles attached to the roof. The Ukrainian-designed Stugna system has a range of over three miles and its missiles can be remotely guided by console or laser-targeted manually. They can also carry many different types of warheads, including tandem-style rounds designed to break tank armor, high-explosive fragmentation, and even thermobaric payloads. The Stugna is usually fired from a tripod on the ground, requiring two to four soldiers to reload and move the unit. But mounting the anti-tank weapons on a technical gives them far more flexibility, allowing them to be used for hit-and-run missions. But Ukraine's ingenuity doesn't end there. A similar domestically produced missile system, the RK-3 Corsair, was seen on a buggy in another part of the country earlier this summer. Usually ground-based like the Stugna, Corsair systems have a range of 1.5 miles and can also use a range of different shells. Even lighter than pickup trucks, these deadly dune buggies have become invaluable to Ukrainian troops as the war has moved into the eastern part of the country. Many other rocket launchers have also been spotted on Ukraine's buggies, including dated Soviet weaponry. For instance, one video shows a buggy covered in camouflage netting firing a 9M111 Fagot wire-guided missile system. These buggies themselves are pretty badass too. They appear to be from a range of models. Some are likely modified versions of the Ranger or MRZR models produced by US defense contractor Polaris. In their off-the-shelf form, these vehicles are intended for reconnaissance and logistics missions rather than open combat. Depending on the model, the Polaris Dune buggies have over 100 to 200 horsepower and over a 2,000 pound payload capacity. Despite being very light and maneuverable, they also have an extremely durable chassis and strong suspension, making them ideal for navigating difficult areas. But Ukrainians also appear to have reinforced theirs with body armor and camouflage for extra protection against Russian fire. Other Ukrainian buggies have been far more homemade. One, captured in a photograph by the Associated Press, was constructed from a Peugeot 307 coupe convertible and with the doors and windows removed. While not a tactical vehicle like the Polaris buggies, the Peugeot 307 is still fast, 
able to go from 0 to 60 in 8 to 10 seconds. Speed is crucial for Ukraine's technicals, especially for the country's rapid counteroffensives in recent months. The buggy hosting the Corsair missile system is yet another model. This variety of buggy also seems to have been domestically manufactured. It has two seats in front and a cargo platform at the rear of the vehicle, fitted with a tripod and optics for the Corsair missile system. On the road, two missiles are carried in storage boxes at the back for easy retrieval and use. But how have these strange-looking dune buggies and other technicals helped Ukraine hold its own against Russian tanks and artillery? Early in the war, they played a part in helping Ukrainians repel Russia's initial push into Kyiv. Their high maneuverability proved much better at urban combat than cumbersome tanks. And after the Russian offensive failed, the fighting moved east shifting into a heavy artillery war in the Donbass and Luhansk regions. For a number of reasons, technicals have been even more important in this context. Despite its battlefield victories, Ukraine has been heavily outgunned by Russia all year. While this has started to change thanks to the influx of Western weaponry, Russia's enormous guns can still easily destroy slow-moving and immobile targets. But by attaching their firepower to technicals, Ukraine has made their artillery much harder to destroy. Another advantage has to do with geography. While the eastern part of Ukraine is relatively flat, it is crisscrossed with rivers and has fewer major roads in the west. This means that much of the fighting is taking place in the countryside, where technicals have a substantial mobility advantage over tanks. Russian tank losses have been enormous, and by mid-October, they had lost nearly 1,400 tanks, averaging nearly 10 a day. Ukraine's inventive use of technicals has contributed to these startling numbers. Whatever course the war may take this winter, it seems likely that technicals will remain a key part of Ukrainian operations due to their speed, flexibility, and low cost. While they certainly look like something out of a dystopian universe, these vehicles have proven themselves to be extremely effective in real-life combat. And just as they have gotten more inventive since the beginning of the war, Ukraine's technicals will probably keep evolving as they receive new and more lethal weapons from the West. But what do you think? How valuable have the technicals been to Ukraine? And will they keep being used and upgraded? Let us know in the comments section below. And if you want more military analysis from military experts, make sure you subscribe. Have you ever seen a real-life death ray? Well, if you haven't seen this clip of Russian troops advancing across a small, cratered field and suddenly getting struck by a powerful explosion, you may have been living under a rock. The video posted on Twitter by Ukrainian officer Anatoly Stefan, dubbed Destruction of Russians with a Death Ray, went viral, racking up more than 2.5 million views in just days, and it's not surprising. Dubbed a Death Ray because of the thin trail of smoke left in the weapon's wake, the video demonstrated incredible accuracy. As the survivors flee, they are struck by two more shots, leaving only bodies behind on the field. Online, supporters of Ukraine cheered the strike's seemingly mysterious and deadly firepower. But what are we looking at here? What exactly is this death ray? And just how effective could such a weapon be against Putin's forces? Many who viewed the video, including the poster himself, noted that the footage in question most likely shows a Stokna P, a Ukrainian-made anti-tank guided missile system, or ATGM. Military expert David Hambling recently told Newsweek that he in fact believes this weapon to be a Stugna missile, which is often identified by its odd-looking smoke trail and, trust us, it's not referred to as a death ray for nothing. Ukraine's Stugna P missiles were first developed in the 1980s and 90s as a way to boost domestic defense capabilities and have since become a prominent weapon in the Ukrainian military arsenal. In 2021, Ukraine was in possession of over 7,000 Stugnas, with many more in production. While a version of the system, called the Skiff, has also been exported to Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Putin's increasing hostilities created an urgent need for more weapons in Ukraine. As a result, many of the Skiffs being produced for foreign customers were diverted back to Ukraine, leading to videos of Stugnas with Arabic characters being used against Russian forces. These missiles are notable and desirable for their versatility, accuracy, and effectiveness against modern armor. This combination of factors, while not exactly a death ray, makes the Stugna P one of the most valuable assets in Ukraine's recent efforts to defend itself against Russian aggression. The Stugna P was developed by the Ukrainian state-owned enterprise Luch Design Bureau, which has a long history of designing and producing high-tech military equipment. The Stugna missile was originally designed to fill the gap in the Ukrainian military's capability to destroy heavily armored targets, such as tanks and fortifications, from a safe distance. The Stugna P missile and launcher weigh over 60 pounds, 27.2 kilos each, and the system usually uses a 17.5, 8 kilo tandem warhead that can penetrate the armor of even the most advanced tanks. 
Additionally, its guidance system uses a semi-automatic command to line of sight sac -loss method, which allows the operator to guide the missile to its target using a sight or other sighting device. This remote piloting is a rather unusual feature for a small-sized ATGM like the Stugner. The operator can be up to 50 meters away from the missile, watching the target via remote video link. This video feed is often captured on soldiers' cell phones, one reason why social media is filled with footage of odd-looking strikes like the Death Ray. The ability to be operated remotely also means that soldiers using Stugner missiles are more difficult to retaliate against, which has helped reduce Ukrainian casualties. But that's not even the beginning of how all-around badass this weapon is. While it is heavier and slightly less powerful than the American Stinger or British Javelin missiles, the Stokner P can be launched from a variety of platforms, including by infantry soldiers, light vehicles and helicopters. This versatility has made it an extremely valuable asset for the Ukrainian military, since it can be used in a wide range of scenarios and environments. Early in the war, many of the Stugners were deployed in urban areas, destroying scores of Russian tanks on the roads to Kyiv. With the war's new focus in eastern Ukraine, Stugner missiles have proven valuable in rural off-road settings. This is partly because the missile is also highly effective against other types of armored targets, such as armored personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles, which Russia has relied on to supply its invasion force. Some Ukrainian troops have even adapted the Stugna missile system to be extra portable by mounting it on the back of fast-moving civilian vehicles or transporting mobile hunter-killer teams, consisting of several soldiers who can rapidly fire their missiles and then retreat before they can be targeted by enemy artillery or drones. The Stugna system consists of a lightweight launch tube and a missile that is fitted with a high-explosive anti-tank or heat warhead. The heat warhead is a tandem round, actually consisting of two parts a precursor charge and a main charge. The precursor charge is designed to penetrate the outer layer of armor on the target, and the main charge is then detonated to cause significant damage to the target's internal structure. Inside the warhead, the second charge is next to a hollow, metal-lined cone. Upon detonation, the explosive blasts the metal into a narrow, high-speed projectile capable of piercing even the heaviest defenses up to 800 mm. The tandem warhead design is therefore highly effective against almost any modern armor, including reactive armor and composite armor, which are designed specifically to protect against ATGMs. The Stugner P's launch tube is also equipped with a sighting system that allows the operator to accurately engage targets at ranges of up to 3,000 meters. The sighting system incorporates a thermal imaging capability, which provides the operator with the ability to detect and engage targets in low-light and no-light conditions. This has again proven extremely valuable in parts of the eastern Ukraine, where infrastructure and electricity have been knocked out, allowing Ukrainian troops to continue their hit-and-run tactics against Russian artillery and tanks at night. Still not convinced that the Stogna P is one of the fiercest missiles ever invented? No problem, there's more. In addition to its destructive capabilities, the Stogna P has also been praised for its high level of reliability and accuracy. The missile's guidance system is designed to be extremely resistant to electronic countermeasures and jamming, and its relatively compact size and lightweight design don't hinder its accuracy in striking moving targets. Furthermore, the Stugna P's range makes the airborne missile a difficult target for enemy forces to pinpoint, even though the missile is relatively slow-moving compared to some other ATGMs. Its range has made it one of the most effective countermeasures to Russian tanks, by allowing Ukraine to devastate them from hidden off-road positions. Weapon systems like the Stugna are therefore a major reason why Russia has lost more than 1,000 individual tanks since the beginning of the 2022 invasion. In addition to the missile's own targeting capabilities, Ukrainian troops have also showcased uncanny human-guided accuracy in videos like that of the Death Ray. As one Twitter user replied to the post, whoever landed those three shots is, without a doubt, the best ATGM operator on Earth. He's practically sniping with it. The Stugner system is highly effective against a range of non-vehicle targets, including fortifications, buildings, and other structures with tactical importance. And as shown in the video, the system can also be used to engage soft targets such as personnel and unarmored vehicles by swapping out the heat rounds for a high-explosive fragmentation-type warhead. This interchangeability is one of the key reasons why the Stugna P system is a highly versatile and modular weapon, one that can be used to engage a wide range of targets in a variety of scenarios. In recent years, the Stugna P has become an increasingly important part of Ukraine's military strategy, as the country has faced more and more aggression from Russia. Despite Western material support, the phase of the war which began with the 2022 invasion 
has placed a great deal of strain on the Ukrainian military's capabilities, and the Stugna P has proven to be one of the most valuable assets in the defense of Ukrainian territory. The missile's versatility, accuracy, and effectiveness against armor has made it an essential component of the Ukrainian military's effort to protect its citizens and defend its sovereignty. Because of all these factors, the Stugna P missile has become a critical part of Ukraine's military arsenal. And as mentioned, the grinding, ever-changing artillery war in Ukraine's east is an ideal environment for a weapon like the Stugna P, since it can often avoid the punishing retaliations Russia directs against larger missile systems. As the conflict in the east continues, there is little doubt that the Stogna P will likely remain vitally important. Yet questions still remain about whether the weapon captured on video was simply a Stogna P missile or whether there were more elements involved in the attack. There has been some speculation that the strike was not in fact a Stogna, but rather some sort of drone strike. Some have claimed the possibility of a Turkish Bayraktar drone, which Ukraine has received a number of since last year. Others instead argued that the Death Ray is another variant of unmanned vehicle. One former army colonel, who asked not to be named, told Newsweek that the attack may have involved a US-manufactured switchblade drone, a loitering kamikaze munition which dive-bombs a target and destroys itself on impact. Last year, the US committed to sending Ukraine more than 700 switchblades, which are also capable of precision strikes. Retired Colonel Mark F. Kantsian of the Center for Strategic and International Studies has stated that the death ray could have either been a Stogna or some form of drone that fires rockets after approaching its target. Either possibility highlights the deadly effectiveness of Ukraine's weapons technology and training, and that while Ukrainians may have been outgunned at the start of the invasion, they aren't anymore. Whatever the death ray may be, videos like this one make it clear that the future of the war in Ukraine will almost certainly revolve around the strategic use of technology. But let us know what you think. Was the video of a Stugna missile, drone, or something else entirely? And just how much has technology leveled the odds? Give us your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more expert military analysis. Russia invaded Ukraine, partly because Vladimir Putin believed that the country was divided. He expected his troops to be greeted as liberators in many of its oblasts, especially those in the east. None of his fondest hopes came to pass. Instead, the invasion has created a renewed sense of Ukrainian identity, as all segments of society signed on to resist the attack, including the women of Ukraine. In this video, we'll look at those women and the many roles they've played in the war, winning new respect and recognition for themselves in the process against enormously difficult obstacles. In December 2023, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that the military had proposed mobilizing 450 to 500,000 additional troops for the war effort. The move did not come as a surprise, since Ukraine needs more soldiers after its 2023 counteroffensive in Zaporizhia failed to achieve its objectives. In January 2024, Ukrainian lawmakers clarified that the new law would not draft women. This clarification is in line with the tradition of most countries where women are not subject to mass conscription. However, earlier legislation from 2021, as the threat of an invasion loomed, signaled that women were going to be part of Ukraine's war effort from the beginning, and that they would be serving in the areas far exceeding the roles they had traditionally played in the country's military. That year, legislation was passed that required women between 18 and 60 to register for the draft if they were fit for military service and worked in certain professions. This law expanded on an even earlier one and added more professions to the existing list. Previously, women in highly specialized fields, such as medicine, were subject to a draft, but the 2021 law added veterinarians, psychologists, journalists, and even librarians and musicians to the list of professions who could be mobilized in wartime. A further law passed in September 2023 mandated that all women between 18 and 60 with a medical or pharmaceutical background register for military service. However, these women would not be restricted from leaving the country unless they actually were called up to the colors, unlike their male counterparts. Women had served in Ukraine's armed forces since the country's independence in 1991, although it was still rare to see them in roles that went beyond the traditional. Usually, they followed their husbands or fathers as they were transferred between military posts. There, the women would take on various menial tasks, such as administrative jobs. This was in line with Soviet tradition. Things started to change after 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea and parts of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts proclaimed themselves to be separate, independent republics with Russia's backing. As part of the hostilities in Donbass, which started that year, 
women served as combat medics, snipers, and even frontline infantry. When women were not called up to actual service, they still contributed to the cause as civilians by obtaining supplies and delivering them to the front lines. The dangers of these logistical roles should not be overstated, as logistics are frequent targets for air, artillery, and drone attacks. At the start of the full-scale Russian invasion, women made up about 10% of Ukraine's total military force. About 62,000 women are currently serving in Ukraine's armed forces. Of these, 42,000 are serving in military-related positions, with at least 5,000 deployed to the front lines. The 42,000 women involved in a combat-related role is an increase by 40% compared to 2021, when the new laws on conscription began to pass. About 8,000 women are officers. Today, according to Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska, women make up over 20% of Ukraine's total military force. More than 11,000 women have joined the military on a voluntary basis since the war began. As the war drags on into its third year, more women are voluntarily signing up for camps to teach them combat skills, even if they're unsure about joining the force. Although they are exempt from general conscription, they can sign up for military service voluntarily, and more of them are starting to think about it. In these camps, volunteers from the Ukrainian army teach participants how to operate firearms and grenades. In one camp near Kyiv, visited by reporters from DW News, the targets for the training were mock-ups among the who's who of Russia's leadership. There was the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu. There was his rival, the now-deceased Wagner Group frontman, Yevgeny Prigozhin. There was the Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov. And in hiding, there was Vladimir Putin himself. In addition to weapons training, the women at the camp are taught how to operate in squads. Urban combat training is also typically a part of these exercises. The soldiers operating these camps say that the creation of an all-women course is good for the trainees' morale, as it shows them they're not alone. The women have varied reasons for being there. Some want to join the army out of patriotism or to connect with or discover what happened to their fathers, brothers, boyfriends, and husbands. Other women seek the training as an act of self-defense. Some of the women in the camp near Kyiv came from the occupied territories. It's understandable why they, in particular, would seek military training. War crimes, including against civilians, have been frequent in the war in Ukraine. For example, the Russian army has made looting an institution within its ranks. Soldiers have ransacked homes and taken everything from washing machines to lingerie. Unsurprisingly, with such low discipline, crimes against women are also a common occurrence. Sexual violence is widespread in the Russian-occupied territories. In Kherson, which Ukrainian troops liberated in late 2022, prosecutors have collected abundant evidence of crimes against women. These criminal acts include rape, forced nudity, and sexual torture. The oldest victims were over 80. The youngest the prosecutors found was a four-year-old girl who was forced to perform oral sex on a soldier, a crime they classified as rape. Ukrainian prosecutors also found more than a dozen examples of gang rapes, some of which involved family members being forced to watch. The New York Times reported that there were 154 documented cases of conflict-related violence in Kherson, but everyone understood that the real number was far higher. The true extent of sexual violence is difficult to document precisely, especially because victims are often too scared to come forward, a problem exacerbated by Ukraine's low level of infrastructure to support such victims. Women's shelters are rare in Ukraine, for example. Nevertheless, in the villages near Kyiv, which were occupied at the start of the war, investigators found that one in nine women had been subject to some form of sexual assault. As with the widespread practice of looting, Russian officers are often aware of and acquiescent to these incidents, either turning the other way or actively encouraging their men to go ahead. The problem of sexual violence appears to be even worse in the detention centers run by Russian authorities. In Kherson, the use of batons and electric shocks in torture were common. Some Russian soldiers used these as instruments of rape. These methods were similar to those reported in cities under Russian occupation, Human Rights Watch documented similar incidents in the Kharkiv and Chernihiv regions, as the New York Times did in Kherson, and it also reported more incidents of sexual crimes near Kyiv. For the women of Ukraine, learning how to defend themselves is no longer a luxury. Still, Yarina Shornohus, a Ukrainian soldier who spoke to DW about her experiences on the front line, said that women who wished to join the ranks needed to understand that they will be put in a very difficult position, one traditionally assigned to men. 
Women need to be ready to carry heavy things on the front line, she said. If they're not prepared to do that, it will be best for them to do something else, because otherwise their male comrades would make the assumption that all women are like her, which is in turn not good for women's rights in the army. This is important, as women in the Ukrainian army are not safe from harassment within their own ranks. A 2011 study by the Research Center for Humanitarian Issues of the Armed Forces of Ukraine found that 1 in 10 women in the Ukrainian military experienced some kind of sexual harassment, sometimes from senior officers. These cases are often difficult to bring to a court of law because of a lack of willingness to come forward and the he-said-she-said -said nature of the proceedings most of the time. Despite the grave threats from the enemy and the widespread skepticism or harassment from their male comrades, women have served in the Ukrainian army with distinction since the beginning of the war. One role where women have served with particular skill in Ukraine is that of the sniper. After the role of combat medic, women have served as snipers next most often. In this capacity, these women are heirs to a tradition. The Soviet Union famously fielded women in sniper roles during the Second World War, and some of the best of them came from Ukraine. For example, there was Lyudmila Pavlichenko, who is credited with 309 kills during the conflict. She was so good that she earned the nickname Lady Death. She was born in a village near Kyiv. In the early days of the war, a woman known by the codename Charcoal became a hero in Ukraine. A former Marine with years of experience in the Donbass War, she was discharged in January 2022, but was back in the ranks when the invasion came. Her call to fighters on the front line to defeat the Orcs gave her notoriety and increased the morale of Ukraine's defenders. She vowed that she would stand to the last against the invaders. Ukrainian soldiers had even begun to compare her to Lady Death herself, although her precise exploits are not known. Olena Bilozerska, another veteran from the Donbass War, also serves as a sniper, and her exploits are better known. She was once almost killed by a tracer bullet which grazed her cheek. By July 2022, she had 10 confirmed kills to her name. In a night engagement that she recorded, she's seen killing three Russian soldiers crawling toward her position, proving her skill and the effectiveness of the 7.62mm SVDM rifle with the thermal scope that she was using. When the enemy crawls toward our position to kill me, does he think if I have a husband, parents, or kids? Of course not. And I don't bother myself with stupid things either. That stuff is for books and movies, she said in an interview days before the invasion began. When the invasion actually did begin, she said that the Battle of Kyiv was like going on safari, because enemy vehicles moving in dense columns were easy prey for ambushes. Survivors of the attacks on the vehicles then fled on foot into the woods, where territorial defense units or even local hunters picked them off. Emerald Evgenia is perhaps the most famous female sniper in Ukraine. Codenamed Ukraine's Joan of Arc, Evgenia was a successful jewelry entrepreneur before the war, and well-known on Ukrainian social media channels. However, she was also an experienced shooter. She got her first gun from her father at the age of nine, and hit five targets with five rounds on her first hunt. When the war began, she joined as a sniper, quickly proving skeptics wrong thanks to her ability to shoot down drones. Evgenia married a fellow soldier and fought on the front lines, even up to the point of being 30 weeks pregnant. She is well regarded enough that Russian media has given her a nickname of their own, the Punisher. More systematically, the women among Ukraine's sniper ranks are typically selected from the country's territorial defense units. After distinguishing themselves there, the Ukrainian special forces send them for advanced training in the country's western forests. Recruits to this program will not only get specialized shooting training, but training in tactics, ballistics, and movement. Typically, snipers get over a year of training, and this was once the case in Ukraine, but given wartime demands, the schedule has been shortened to a matter of weeks. One of the instructors in the sniper schools, a man known by his codename Deputy, said that despite his initial skepticism, the women proved themselves to the point that he now believes they are better suited for the sniper role than men. In an interview with The Economist in January 2023, he said that the women were lighter and more nimble, stealthier in retreat, and crucially for a sniper, more patient and less willing to take unjustified risks. He was most impressed with their conduct in a military survival course the Ukrainians call FISO. Of 90 candidates for the course at the time of The Economist's visit, only five passed successfully. Only two of them were men. All three of the women passed. These women had faced stigma from skeptical men, but proved themselves. Because of the nature of their job, snipers have always faced elevated risks from the enemy. 
If captured, snipers have faced historically harsh treatment, and the women snipers of Ukraine understand that because of their sex, the risks are even higher for them. One such sniper, a woman calling herself Oksana, said, If a woman sniper is captured, she'll be raped, humiliated, tortured, and then executed. A sniper should always be prepared to blow herself up with a grenade. Sharing deputies' belief that women snipers are more patient than their male counterparts is a 32-year-old sniper with Ukraine's 47th Brigade, with the codename Cuckoo. The title was bestowed on her because she tends to perch herself in high places. While there is a tradition of women serving in sniper roles in this part of the world, the women soldiers of this war are also clearing new paths for themselves. Traditional gender roles began to get challenged as early as the Donbass War. In 2016, Ukraine formally allowed women to fight in combat positions. This edict, which came partially in response to women already doing so on an irregular basis, marked a departure from their traditional roles as nurses, cooks, secretaries or seamstresses. Changes began to accelerate after that, and Ukrainian women saw formal service in the volunteer battalions in other roles. The Russian invasion accelerated the changes even more dramatically. Aside from being snipers, Ukrainian women now see service as machine gunners, tank gunners, with grenade launchers and as mortar crews. One area where women have been on a much more equal footing is that of drone operators. As drones have proven themselves to be immensely important in the war, the women piloting them are equally important members of the Ukrainian war effort. Valery Borovik, a drone commander in Ukraine who recruits and trains women operators, said of the task, Women who can fly drones are people who could tomorrow, if needed, get a drone to target artillery fire. The New York Times interviewed several women who were training to become drone pilots, and much like their counterparts in the training camp at Kyiv, each woman had her own reasons for being there. Some were civilians who wanted to have a useful skill if they were ever called up to the colors. Others were already signed up, but were in more traditional support roles and wanted a combat position. Women might not be as physically strong as men, a fact which still limits their ability to join frontline units, but they are on an equal footing as drone pilots, and the women in the Ukrainian military are keen to exploit this and win greater recognition and footing for themselves in the process of doing such an important job. Other methods of killing Russian soldiers are far cruder and more brutal. Aside from the firearms or drones, Ukraine's women are being trained to kill with office supplies if necessary. A woman named Olena Biletska, who founded a resistance group called the Ukraine's Women's Guard in 2014, bragged that some of her fighters could kill the enemy with a pen or pencil. Other women with partisan groups have been known to poison Russian soldiers by giving them toxin-laced food or liquor. One incident in Crimea saw two attractive women in a partisan group called the Crimea Combat Seagulls poison 24 Russian soldiers and 11 officers after giving them bad vodka and snacks. Enamored by the two cute girls offering them free food and drinks, the Russians took the gifts without question, much to their detriment. The group claims that all of the targets were killed. If women in the Ukraine have been targeted for sex by Russian soldiers, it's in incidents like these where we see the equation being reversed. Ukrainian women have also used their sex as a weapon against the invaders. By the end of 2022, 350 Ukrainian women received rewards for their bravery in combat. Two of them received Ukraine's highest honor, the Hero of Ukraine, posthumously. As of August 2023, about 100 women were killed in action during the war, according to figures obtained by the BBC. The true number is likely significantly higher, but because Ukraine does not break its casualty figures down by gender, it's impossible to say for certain. With the war now two years old, Ukraine has faced recruitment difficulties. Attitudes toward conscription are souring, and the new draft law being debated in Kyiv has met public controversy that other wartime measures have not yet seen. Unsurprisingly, as the grim reality of prolonged warfare sets in, motivations such as patriotism have begun to ebb, and Ukraine's ranks are thinning through attrition or discharges, while draft dodging is becoming an increasing fact of life among the country's men. With Russia having the benefit of a population about three times as large as Ukraine and Vladimir Putin's determination not to lose the war, the Ukrainian military must find a way to increase its available supply of soldiers, which is why we should not be too surprised if the country calls on its women to do even more tasks not typically assigned to them, as there is still no end in sight to the struggle. Despite the threat of capture, sexual violence and frequent harassment from their own comrades, the women of Ukraine have played their part in defending their country from invasion, often with distinction. 
and as the war goes on and manpower becomes scarcer, their country will likely need to rely on them far more than usual. In the West, wartime conditions have historically been a catalyst for a change in the way that women are treated. This war will likely prove to be a catalyst for advances among women in Ukrainian society. One of the snipers in Ukraine, codenamed Sultan, who was one of the three women that passed the FISO course, said to The Economist, She, my daughter, told me that if my death happens, she will be sad, but always have a place in her heart for me. I'm doing everything to make sure her generation doesn't have to deal with Putin and his crazy world. What do you think about the experiences women have faced in the war in Ukraine? What roles might they be called on to serve next? What advances do you think they might make after the war, if they're able to repel what one of their ranks calls the Orcs? Don't forget to let us know your opinions in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. Ever thought of strapping a helicopter rocket launcher to the back of a Mitsubishi truck? Well, as you can see here, Ukrainian fighters have. There is no escape from Ukrainian weaponized civilian Mad Max vehicles. But if you see something like this Soviet-era Volga sedan mounted with a remote-controlled 14.5mm heavy machine gun rampaging your way, you should definitely at least give it a shot. And if you think these trucks are strange, wait till we show you what this 1940 SVT-40 Soviet semi-automatic battle rifle can do. Don't be fooled by its vintage look. This gun is far from being ready to be retired. The Russo-Ukraine war has definitely been producing some of the weirdest weapons we've seen fielded in recent history, maybe even ever, but how weird can it get? Join us as we dive into this rabbit hole and reveal the good, the bad, and the downright strange weapons seeing use in Ukraine, starting with oldies but goodies. It's a common misconception that the newest weapons are the best in modern warfare. Futuristic weapons sporting next-generation designs and big capability promises tend to attract the most public attention, but the war in Ukraine has proven that it's the workhorses, the time-tested OGs, that actually get the job done. In Russia and Ukraine's case, Soviet-era weapons have dominated the battlefield primarily by virtue of their sheer availability and ease of use. This doesn't mean they aren't good. Ukraine's Soviet-era defenses like the S-300 and Buk M1 here, for example, seem to have done an excellent job blunting Russian firepower. The AK-74 and all its variants, such as the AK-74M, are excellent infantry firearms. Ukraine's well-maintained and updated T-72 and T-64 tanks, designs now well over 50 years old, continue to hold their own against Russia's newer iterations, or at least what's left of them. When upgraded with modern electronics and munitions, Soviet-era weapons can more than hold their own in the 21st century. This was the case with the Soviet KH-35 subsonic anti-ship missile that Ukraine overhauled into its R-360 Neptune and used it to sink this jewel of Russia's Black Sea fleet, the Moskva, back in April 2022. There are other examples of Soviet-era weapons being overhauled, upgraded, and flat-out MacGyvered into menacing new packages. Look no further than the trusty RPG-7, the famous Soviet shoulder-fired, muzzle-loaded rocket launcher that has seen service all over the world, for a prime example. RPGs were designed to penetrate tank armor, though their cheap, mass-produced warheads have been used against emplacements, buildings, helicopters, and human targets since the weapon's introduction in 1961. With plenty of cheap RPG rounds at their disposal, Ukraine has adapted certain warheads for more effective anti-personnel use. Video evidence from early in the conflict showed a fearless Ukrainian demolitions expert taking an angle grinder to a live 82mm mortar round, loosening the stabilizer fins with a couple of hatchet blows, and fitting an adapter manufactured by volunteers, all to fit the mortar onto an RPG booster. No mobile mortar system, no problem. All you have to do is strap a rocket booster to a mortar round, like this, and you get a man-portable anti-personnel munition that can be fired from a 15-pound tube. Ingenuity at its best. If this shoulder-fired RPG mortar hybrid didn't get the job done, why not just strap a bunch of anti-personnel grenades in a radial pattern around the anti-tank warhead itself? Well, that was exactly the line of thinking for some Ukrainian frontline units hoping to add a bit more juice to their anti-infantry RPG lineup. Images of makeshift explosives surfaced online revealing just that an RPG warhead with a half-dozen grenades fastened to it, a Frankenstein creation tailor-made for omnidirectional destruction. 
If the humble RPG is any indication, there are classics in use that are still very functional. And then there are classic throwbacks that are real head scratches. With the 75th anniversary celebrations unfolding around the globe, many weapons that played starring roles in World War II have been making their greatest hits comeback in Ukraine. Here are some of the most notable sightings. The Mosin Nagant M1891-30 and its successor, the SVT-40. Back in the heady days of 1891, well over 100 years ago, Captain Sergei Mosin chambered a 7.62x54mm R cartridge into his finalized bolt-action assembly after a decade of experimentation and pulled the trigger of a firearm that would ultimately become one of the most mass-produced military bolt-action rifles in history. 37 million Mosin rifles were built over the next eight decades, as the rifle saw service in 42 separate conflicts, a remarkable testament to its durability, reliability, and versatility. As you might have guessed, the Russo-Ukrainian War is the latest conflict to feature the time-worn Mosin. Updated in 1930, long and carbine versions of the M1891-30 model, the self-same workhorse that helped deliver the Allied victory in the East during World War II, has been seen in service today with Ukrainian and Russian forces alike. Dating back to 2014, Ukrainian separatists in the Donbass regularly utilized the Mosin in sniper roles. Some were doled out to Russian conscripts from deep Soviet stocks after Putin's military mobilization last year. Several of the Mosin's eventual successors, the semi-automatic SVT-40, SKS and the infamous AK-47, have also been seen in use. But this is just the beginning. The water-cooled M1910 Maxim machine gun. One of the strangest sightings in Ukraine actually predates the antiquated Mosin, if you can believe that. Somewhere, someplace, American inventor Hiram Maxim must have been looking on with an amused smile on his face when the armed forces of Ukraine wheeled his revolutionary M1910 Maxim machine gun out of storage. Yes, that Maxim gun, the world's first reliable, effective, mass-produced machine gun, and started using them back in the mid-2010s against the Russians in the Donbass. The Maxim was invented in 1884 and remained in production until 1945, widely adopted around the globe by imperial powers hell-bent on killing each other in two world wars and a host of other conflicts. The Soviets adopted it in 1930, and as the Soviet surplus often did, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, 35,000 Maxims found their way into Ukrainian storage. Many of them were dusted off, mounted onto vehicles, placed at checkpoints and fortifications, and used in other ways to repel the Russian invaders. Sporting protective armor plates and two heavy wheels to add mobility and stability, the Maxim uses the same 7.62x54mm ammunition as many other Soviet machine guns. Capable of firing 600 rounds a minute up to 3,000 meters away, the heavy Maxim is certainly not the best machine gun option on the battlefield, but this great war-killing machine is still showing its effectiveness 131 years later. Old Man Maxim would be proud. Other vestiges of the past have surfaced too. Back in 1947, the Soviet Union produced its last PPSH-41, a workhorse submachine gun used by the millions during World War II. With its recognizable drum magazine and high rate of fire, the open bolt burp gun fired 7.62 by 25 mm pistol rounds and saw use after World War II in Korea and Vietnam. Certain photos showed PPSH-41s and the PPS-43, its stamped steel brother in the hands of certain Ukrainian DNR separatist fighters and internal police units in the war's first few months, perhaps more a sign of desperation than utility. It wasn't the only World War II-era machine gun to feature, though. The unmistakable DPM, DP-27 and 28, the mainstay Red Army light machine gun by 1945, have also been seen with their traditional pan, circular top-loaded machine gun chambered for the 7.62x54mm R cartridge. The DPM was eventually replaced by the more robust PK series of light machine guns that are seen around the world. But lead is lead, and clearly the dusty DPM can still hold its own from time to time. We're not sure how many of these are actually in use, but they are certainly there. Speaking of chunky, relatively unwieldy Soviet-designed firearms that refuse to die, Ukrainian soldiers have been seen firing 80-plus-year-old PTRS-41 and PTRD-41 anti-tank rifles from covert positions. These bulky metal rifles were designed from 1938 to 1939 and produced throughout World War II as a stopgap to help Soviet infantrymen stand a chance against German lightly armored vehicles. The gun was essentially an SKS on steroids. 
For such a relatively cheap weapon, the weapon's 14.5 by 114mm armor-piercing cartridges certainly did the job, penetrating armor plates up to 40mm thick from 100 meters away. Reportedly used off and on by militiamen in the Donbass firing World War II vintage ammunition since 2014, they are still seen on social media from time to time. There are a few honorable mentions on our list. Firearms spotted on the battlefield as old as the ones we've already spoken about, but whose actual use can't be confirmed. These include several Nazi weapons including the MP40 and STG-44 submachine gun, as well as the MG42, the lead-spitting beast whose modern variant the MG3 remains in use in more than 40 countries. Ironically, while certain Ukrainian units used a Nazi-designed machine gun to repel Russian soldiers, early photos from the war showed American-built Lend-Lease Thompson submachine guns taken from captured Russian prisoners. It's impossible to know if this was a one-off sighting, but its presence makes odd sense, considering the United States shipped millions of Tommy guns to the Soviets, then fighting the Nazis back during World War II. Adding more American flavor to the hodgepodge of vintage firearms in Ukraine, if Russian state media is to be believed, the Ukrainians have been using US-made M101 towed howitzers firing 105mm shells on front lines near Zaporizhia, an artillery piece fielded by the US Army during World War II. These M101s were allegedly donated by Lithuania back in September 2022. What about imported flavors? 32 nations from tiny North Macedonia to Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, and Sweden have all pledged varying amounts of military aid to Ukraine since the start of the war. Some countries, like the United States, can offer tens of billions of dollars worth of expensive vehicles, drones, munitions, and equipment. Others, like Portugal, donate grenades, small arms ammunition, some automatic rifles, and firefighting helicopters. That Ukraine has taken this jumbled admixture of arms and equipment and made it work speaks to their pluck and resourcefulness, traits the Western world has come to admire. In this deluge of aid, a long list of modern small arms have flowed into the country. Ukraine is unique in the annals of military history in that respect, an independent country whose rapidly revitalized military operates with such a vast range of amalgamated systems and platforms. Across the front lines, soldiers are now fighting with M4 carbines, M240s, M32 grenade launchers, and M2 Brownings, alongside smaller numbers of submachine guns donated by private American companies. Desert Tech sent its Bullpup SRS A1 anti-material rifle, an insanely accurate rifle that fires the powerful .338 Lapua Magnum round, while Keltec sent 400 sub-2009 mm machine guns to make up for a civilian contract they'd lost track of. There's even been a sighting of a suppressed American Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle. To this list, the Ukrainians employ many foreign imports. Czech firearms like the CZ-805 Bren and the ZVI Falcon Op-99 anti-material rifle, British Starstreak laser-guided high-velocity air defense systems, futuristic-looking Belgian FN-2000s, German MP5s, and licensed versions of Israeli small arms like the Tavor and Negev manufactured by Fort, a Ukrainian firm based out of Vinitsia. We've also seen next-generation variants of time-tested designs surface like the Bullpup ASH 12.7 and the Russian-made assault rifle or the AK-12, a fifth-generation Kalashnikov assault rifle introduced in just 2018. Unlike the AK-74, the AK-12 is chambered in the 5.45 by 39mm round, with the Russian variant capable of firing the 7.62, known as the AK-15. With its free-floating barrel, cheaper cost per unit, and stronger construction, the AK-12 features improved accuracy and resilience. Okay, let's get to the juicy stuff. The ripest field for weird weapons during the Ukraine war hasn't really been in a field at all. It's been in the air, where unmanned drones and cruise missiles rule the skies and deliver pinpoint destruction at the push of a joystick. Recently, a Russian blackjack strategic bomber fired a KH-55 cruise missile stripped of its nuclear warhead at Ukraine. Yes, you heard that right. They fired a nuclear-capable cruise missile albeit an older one designed in the 1980s, with weighted ballast in place of its nuclear warhead. But why? The KH-55 cruise missile was first designed in the mid-1970s. Fired from the belly of a Tupolev Tu-160 Blackjack supersonic bomber, the turbofan 200 kiloton yield cruise missiles were the spear of Russia's nuclear deterrent for decades. It may seem strange, but firing an inert nuclear cruise missile makes some sense. Increasingly, as Ukrainian air defenses improve, Russia has seen less success bombarding civilian infrastructure. Cruise missiles are expensive, and Russia seems to be running out. 
Using older air-launched KH-55 missiles plucked out of storage might be Russia's way of trying to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses without wasting money on expensive missiles that get intercepted or miss their mark. Russia has tried to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses in other ways too. Back in March 2022, Ukraine released photos of a partially destroyed mystery munition, resembling a dart released from an Iskander-M short-range ballistic missile. The strange devices were each a foot long, painted with an orange tail, and contained a heat source but no explosive warhead. The findings were puzzling. Experts believe the darts to be bomblets on part of some sort of cluster munition package. Later, they revised their thesis arguing these dart-like munitions were some sort of penetration aid, a Cold War-era device used as a countermeasure to help primary ballistic missiles reach their target. The darts worked as decoys, like the KH-55 cruise missile mentioned earlier. Loaded up with electronic jammers and heat sources, they can attract missiles, full radars, and foil infrared seekers. Jeffrey Lewis, professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, claimed it was a very curious decision by the Russians to use decoy missiles, considering that at that stage Ukraine still lacked the military capabilities to successfully shoot down Iskander missiles. These penetration aids were highly classified for decades, making their subsequent discovery an intelligence bonanza for the West. Another mysterious impact crater, this one far from Ukraine in the Croatian capital of Zagreb, made the world wonder what on earth the Russian military was up to one month into its invasion. On March 10, 2022, an unmanned aerial vehicle overflew Romanian, Hungarian and Croatian airspace, flying 430 miles per hour at 4,300 feet before careering into a Croatian school campus and crashing into soft ground. The local residents were fortunate the drone landed just 160 feet from a highly populated student dormitory. Incredibly, nobody was hurt. Initial theories claimed it had been a Ukrainian army recon drone. Inspections of the surviving wreckage painted a different picture. The presence of Cyrillic markings and a Soviet Red Star insignia prompted an American analyst to identify the aircraft as a Russian Tupolev Tu-141 drone, an unmanned aircraft used since the 1970s. Subsequent investigations revealed that the drone was indeed carrying a warhead. Nobody ever found out whether it had been a Russian drone or was in fact an off-course Ukrainian drone that ran out of fuel. Either way, the crash sparked an international incident, with residents and politicians from several NATO countries wondering how such a drone could so effortlessly penetrate their airspace. But the drone story doesn't end there. Russia has employed plenty of drones to observe and attack Ukrainian civilian and military targets. One of the most unique iterations has been the Zala KUB BLA Kamikaze drone, a short-range loitering munition manufactured by a subsidiary of the Kalashnikov company. The KUB BLA, measured with a wingspan of 1.2 meters, can carry a 3 kilogram payload and travel 130 kilometers per hour. It has a maximum range of 40 kilometers and a flight time of 30 minutes, so it can't be employed far beyond Russian positions, but it can make use of AI technologies on approach, making adjustments and identifying its static target. Several KUB BLA drones were intercepted over Kyiv in the early days of the invasion, sparking theories that they were being used to target Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky and decapitate the Ukrainian government. Some of the most interesting drone footage captured during the war, however, doesn't come from military drones at all. It comes from the cheap, commercially produced drones that the Ukrainians have jerry-rigged for all manner of missions. Using 3D printers, a soldering iron, cheap hardware, and some plain old-fashioned ingenuity, Ukraine's army of commercial drones have now been retrofitted for offensive service, and to great effect. It took lots of experimentation and refinement to engineer a light enough grenade to knock out enemy armor using nothing but altitude and gravity. Very quickly, Ukrainians succeeded in engineering lightweight munitions that did not affect a drone's flight path whatsoever. A real engineering masterclass. War is economy. It's money. One Ukrainian soldier commented on the rationale for making everyday drones more lethal. If you have a drone for $3,000 and a grenade for $200, and you destroy a tank that costs $3 million, that's very interesting. Interesting indeed. Makeshift air-delivered care packages have gone on to achieve global renown, both the deadly and the benign. Viral videos show deft Ukrainian drone operators conducting the wartime equivalent of a basketball trick shot, landing grenades in open tank hatches, underground air pipes, narrow trenches, and populated foxholes from hundreds of feet in the air. In other settings, drone modifications have been shown being used to transport small packages of sugar to frontline soldiers, and even most recently, to steal an enemy radio set from a dead Russian soldier that was subsequently used to listen in on enemy plans for several days. 
The Ukrainians have thanked their Russian enemy for their default Lend-Lease program. Abandoned and salvaged equipment, most of it virtually interchangeable with what they already carry into battle, provides an ongoing boon to Ukrainian military effectiveness. But not all strange and unique weapons are captured intact. While the Ukrainians will make use of the captured firearms and other weapons for a long time to come, vehicle debris recovered after a skirmish almost a year ago revealed a destroyed Russian prototype tank many believed to be one of a kind. Video footage from a March 17, 2022 clash showed the burnt-out remains of a completely unique tank, a T-80 UM-2 Black Eagle. This particular Black Eagle was in bad shape. Like so many before and after it, its autoloader had taken a direct hit, which promptly exploded and blew its turret clean off. It was an interesting find. The T-80 UM-2 was once part of a next-generation tank development project, codenamed Object 640, or Black Eagle. The first iteration of the main battle tank appeared in 1997. At the time, Russia touted the experimental, modified T-80U as something that would easily hold its own against Western main battle tanks like the M1A2 Abrams. It boasted Cactus Explosive Reactive Armor ERA panels on its front hull and track skirts, a welded steel turret, anti-fragmentation screens around the main gun and eventually, Drozd-2 Active Protection System a radar-operated anti-rocket and missile fragmentation defense net that can disable incoming munitions 20 to 30 feet from the tank. Unfortunately and predictably for Russia, the project never got off the ground. The T-80 UM-2 never entered production, and the prototype became a trial platform for new systems until, in early 2022, it was lumped into a Russian military column, ambushed north of Kyiv, and utterly destroyed. Perhaps Russia was keen to test out its capabilities on the modern battlefield. At any rate, one of the only tanks deployed to Russia so far to feature an anti-protection system didn't fare well. Remember that saying, desperate times call for desperate measures? Having now lost over 1,600 confirmed tanks in battle, 536 of them captured outright by Ukraine, Russia's real strategy has been to scrape the bottom of the barrel for dilapidated and poorly maintained Soviet-era surplus in its stocks, hastily modernize them and ship them off into the meat grinder for use by ill-trained conscripts and mercenaries. Recent images on social media, for example, show several BRDM-2MS 4x4 armored reconnaissance vehicles being overhauled at Russia's 103rd armored repair plant near Cheetah in Siberia. However, the BRDM-2MS isn't much to write home about. It's an updated version of the BRDM-2, a Soviet amphibious lightly armored vehicle introduced into service back in 1966. Fitted with a coaxial 7.62 machine gun and a one-man turret with a 14.5mm KPVT machine gun, mechanics were shown outfitting the paint-chipped vehicle with new thermal sights and, hopefully, a new coat of paint. Which again begs the question, why? Given the rate of vehicular destruction in Ukraine, operating the four-man BRDM-2MS will be like riding a tin box into battle against the likes of the modern AT-4, Javelin, or Enlor. Yes, it's nice to have wheels when you're an infantryman, but all the time and energy spent modernizing or perhaps more accurately, restoring a vehicle that will barely stand up to Ukrainian artillery, mines, and tanks, much less the far cheaper Western anti-tank missiles commonly employed across the front just seems counterproductive like Putin's entire war. Yes, it may just be for show. Perhaps it may even excel in a behind-the-lines transport role. Nobody knows just how many BRDMs will see combat. But if they are deployed to the front, one Twitter user observed that Russia's upgrades are tantamount to having an 82 Honda and slapping a backup camera to it. They certainly won't protect their occupants. We do know that the same repair plant has modernized oodles of Cold War antique T-62s of all types the same ones seen on railway cars headed to the front at various stages of the war thus far. Most of these museums on tracks, culled from deep storage, have not seen combat in decades, if at all, and their maintenance records reflect that fact. Most are being fitted with new engines, thermal imaging, bulkier armor, new comms, and better optics. The mere presence of the T-62 in Ukraine, 20,000 of which were being mass-produced during the Cold War from 1961 to 1973, shows how depleted Putin's starting lineup of T-80 and T-72 tanks has become. Attrition has forced him deep into his reserves. The number of T-72s in storage are reported to be far lower than anticipated, many of them mothballed and unsalvageable. T-62s are often used by reserve units in the east and thus kept in better condition. But if they get deployed to the front, no amount of cope cages welded onto the T-62 chassis will be able to protect these relics from destruction. 
Think of what would happen if all of a sudden the United States armed forces started wheeling M60s out of storage and slapping modern equipment onto them. Sure, it could do something, the same way a T-62 can. If deployed to fortify an occupied town or doled out as a training implement, it could provide some utility. But as David Axe, a Forbes defense writer, said it, there's no evidence the T-62s played any meaningful role in the fighting. There's ample evidence their four-man crews abandoned the tanks at first opportunity. The Cheetah plant has allegedly been tasked with refurbishing 800 T-62s by 2025. As you may have noticed, this list of the strangest, weirdest weapons in Ukraine isn't exactly short, and it's hardly exhaustive. Ukrainian soldiers have reportedly captured one Russian prisoner armed with a Chinese-made single-shot pellet rifle. There is also that iconic image of a Russian Roskvadia member guarding a checkpoint in Kherson with an antique 12-pound Napoleonic-era cannon. It could all be a joke, a stunt for social media, or a decoy to fool the Ukrainians. Either way, it's surreal that so many historic and head-scratching pieces have made their way onto the battlefields of Ukraine. Did we miss anything? What's your strange weapon of choice from this list? Let us know in the comments.